Hello and welcome to Super Geek Season 2, Episode 15. My name is George, I'm your host. With me today, as usual, is my friend Carlos Pedraza. How are you doing, Carlos? Doing great. Cool. And Son, how are you doing today, Son? Uh, I'm doing okay. Awesome. We have a few topics to cover. Well, there's a lot to cover this week, um, including a Stan Lee tribute, which we'll do in a little bit. But um, Son wanted to bring up something that uh, I'm interested in talking about because I just saw a documentary on this. Uh, son. Uh, today marks the 40th anniversary of the Jonestown Massacre in Guyana. And uh, I, 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 I always try to bring this up when I can, especially on the anniversary of it, to, um, to highlight that it's not always some raging, you know, just, just evil person that we consider everything that they did evil that can, that can just wipe out people. Like, everybody goes to Hitler, Hitler was evil, or Stalin, Stalin was evil, and yeah, Jim Jones was a very evil person. But what the, the ideas behind what he stood for are things that people look up to every day. Very utopian and socialist and togetherness ideas. It was just his, 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 his own personal demons and his own, uh, you know, his own charisma and his own evilness that created what happened there. Not only that, but it also, um, like... I agree with what you're saying. He tried to be inclusive too, but it was actually a facade. It wasn't like, it, that was the interesting thing about it. It happened when I was eight years old. Um, and I remember my parents talking about it over the years, but I just never really, I just knew that, you know, Jim, I, I did, got confused with the different suicide things like the Kool-Aid thing. And then this one, uh, wait, this was, this was, was this the Kool-Aid? No, this is, I think of the brown acid thing, but this is the Kool-Aid one. Um, and well, yeah, it was, it was flavor aid. Right, flavor, yeah, and the cyanide and all the chemicals they put in yeah. to do that. And the thing is, is that he had reached out to, he had become friendly with Russia because he was embracing more of a communist. He he, he was trying to use the, we're, we're really socialist, but the communist, it was more leaning towards communism, except that, you know, the only difference was it wasn't through a military regime, but it might as well have been because he was hiding a lot of the truth. It, but the, well, I mean, the, well, I mean, his his inner. I mean, most of most of his staff and his inner circle were like were armed in Jonestown. But here's the difference between him and all the other dictators out there that embrace communism and things like that. He embraced a religious cult view a under that umbrella, and that was what was different from him than say Russia or North Korea or places well, like he wasn't that. ever he wasn't ever More really a, a political leader. He wasn't really a political leader. He was a he was a religious leader. I mean, he led right. he led a but cult. With socialist you know, he was much more leanings, yeah. Yeah, but you know, the, the actual the actual tenets he espoused, I mean, in many cases were just basically just bullshit because he just wanted to, you know, attract people to his to his cult. Right. And um, you know, and and control them using that. I, he was he was in it simply for the for the power and um you know, and the glory, um, and I think he he probably morphed his actual ideology to suit, you know, to suit, uh, uh, you know, to whatever would be more likely to attract more followers to his cause. I mean, anyone who's lived any any amount of time in San Francisco knows someone who knows someone who was involved with uh, uh, with uh, uh, the Jonestown cult uh because it it started there and uh so it's still um you know when i moved to san francisco as an adult um it it um kind of amazed me how it was still something an issue that resonated in in that city even though you know it had been so long since since it had happened that's because there's there 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 is no closure to a story like that ever was it the the Hagley's yeah, comet cult that all like killed themselves? Yeah, there, I remember really that story no, too. There's there's really no there's really never any closure to any sort of mass suicide. Even if we can blame a single person, there's there's no closure there because suddenly they're there and then they're gone. Well, what was more tragic though about the Jonestown thing versus the one from the uh, the Heaven's Gate one, which is the one you're talking about uh, just now with the Haley's comet? 
Heaven Skate cult, though, they actually all agreed and believed what they were doing. With Jonestown, by the end of it, I mean, there's, there's so much proof, there's so much documentation, tape recordings, videos, all oh, yeah, that, no. is that they, at the end, they didn't want to do it, but they were forced. And, you know, the kids were forced, and everybody was forced. But at the, they didn't all do it because they wanted to, but at the very end, they were forced. And um, whereas with the Heaven's Gate thing, they did their thing because they really actually believed it by the end. Um, oh, so. yeah, no, yeah, I, I, that that I understand completely, because everything that Jim Jones was, was starting to crumble. I mean, partly under his own paranoia at the time, and partly because people people just started realizing, I, I may have been poor back in the United States, but this is not self-sustaining. I'm worse off here than I was being poor in the United States. I can't. That's I disagree when the, on that uh, one. That's when. That's why when the well, no. I mean, it's documented that they weren't able to self-sustain the the agricultural community. They yeah, spent, they had to keep. They had to keep. Um, they had to keep getting. Uh, they picked a bad location. They had to keep getting uh, spending money and getting money to s have supplies come in, and, and people were starting to get you know malnourished and things like that because they weren't able to, like you said, right. sustain. The, the, these the, the, people, these people, wound up spending their entire life savings on this idea that they could find a place to be their own and be self-sustaining, and it was falling apart in front of them. Yeah, I don't want to spend too long talking about this, but I, um, I think it is a worthy topic. I agree with you. I saw a documentary on Netflix. We just wanted to talk about this, and I had gotten um, because of the anniversary coming up. I, I remember uh, skimming across an interview with one of the survivors, one of the reporters that got shot. In fact, she was shot like eight times, and she was there for uh, 24 hours almost, laying in the, on that plane field. You know, she thought she was going to die. For some reason, she didn't bleed out and die. Oh, the, the aftermath of that was horrific because just, just the failure to do anything with the bodies for, for over a week. Right. Well, they had a problem with the government there. Um, where was it again? New Guinea? I forget where it was. Guyana. Guyana, sorry. Um, they had a problem with getting the government to agree to let them, you know, do whatever. And then they finally said, okay, let's let people in here to investigate what's going on and what happened. And because that congressman, you know, they, they just had a lot of problems with the whole getting permission to come in, uh, and, and, and check out what happened. And, uh, cause they had a sign and, uh, so but when they finally figured out what it, what had actually gone down, it was just I think they were embarrassed that government. Um, so, but there's a lot to it. This is an interesting. It's worth checking out that documentary on Netflix. It's very informative. I don't remember exactly what it's called. I don't know if it's Jonestown or, but I'm sure it's easy to find if you start do a search for Jonestown or Jim Jones. But um, yeah. yeah, it was crazy. It's just it's 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 important to remember that. You know, it's it's not always people we can perceive as evil that are that are people who are truly evil, and the people can, that can that, and and are people that can lead us to our own destruction. It it, it can happen. It's happened before, and it can easily happen again. And uh, yeah, so it's definitely something to remember. They they that old saying applies. Yeah, those that forget history are doomed to repeat it. So yeah, I mean, look at that recent cult that uh, the girl who played Chloe on Smallville. Uh, was in involving with the sex trafficking. Uh, that's a more recent example like that. Uh, not that they committed mass suicide, but they could have if they hadn't been caught um, I, a sooner. You know what I mean? Like that right there is an example of a group that could have become like a Jim, a Jonestown. Well, um, I mean, not every cult turns into Jonestown. Right. I, mean, I know. But I'm just saying, you know, I, I don't think that's like a, a natural progression. I mean, it's happened it's in extreme. some instances, yeah, but you know, uh, I mean, once I they cross the, the line into a cult, so, well, yeah, but like once you cross the line into getting armed, then usually something's going to happen because you're armed. Yeah. So uh, I think that's the that's the 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 line that divides a a, a non lethal from an eventually lethal cult, I guess. Yeah, it's possible. Um, so moving on to a different little topic that um, the Dumbo trailer dropped and. I I actually waited a few days to see it because it, it's that thumbnail. I agree with uh, a lot of mutual friends who that clown face thumbnail kind of makes you go, uh, I don't know if I want to.
But I finally gave in because everybody was going, I'm not going to watch this just because of that tri- that thumbnail with the with the clown face. And I'm like, why not? I, I clicked it's, it. It's, it's, it's Uncanny Valley. It's heavily Uncanny Valley, that, that Dumbo picture. But Thumb- I will say, Dumbo. I'm glad Thumb- I clicked it. It was one of the greatest trailers I've ever seen. It made me feel emotion. Uh, I want to see this movie. Many reasons. Not just because it looks amazing, uh, but because you got you got um, Tim Burton reuniting. Well, they worked together again since Batman Returns. But him and Michael Keaton and Danny DeVito from Batman Returns. And, and on top of that, it looks incredible. Um, and I love the way they juxtapose Colin Farrell's character's family and his feeling like he's a failure with Dumbo going through the mother separation thing and you know being the misfit and you know i've had some people i've seen posts where people said oh i don't like seeing bullying it's i don't see the bullying in the trailer all i see dumbo is like he 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 lost his confidence with his mother left he's sad and then the kids are trying to get him to you know prove hey if you can fly everything changes you become more important, so then they're going to want to reunite you with your mom. At least that's what I got out of it. I, 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 it's been so long since I've seen the original cartoon, but I do remember that they they threw in the mouse in the picture. But I don't think he talks in this one. I think it's going to that's not going to be the case. But um, I don't know. What do you guys think? I, I, I was really surprised how much this trailer uh, emotionally got me wanting to see this. Well, I mean, it certainly looks stylish. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, it's a I, you know, I love Dumbo. I didn't have a problem with the clown face because, I mean, he was, it was sort of supposed to sort of be Uncanny Valley. It was supposed to, you were supposed to see, you know, him as pathetic because they made him, you know, they, they dolled him up like this in, in a way that was just sort of humiliating. So, um, you know, so I guess it was, you know, mission accomplished. <laughs> Yeah, I guess the um, the part that I, I think that people consider it bullying is they look at it like I've heard some people compare it to the John Bonet Ramsey thing with the when you take a little, you take a little girl and you put the makeup on them, and make them like look older. It's like almost like a like like that, like it's it's inappropriate. And well, I mean, I, if you remember in the original cartoon, and and I'll admit this seemed kind of racist. You had those black crows who were putting on a really heavy black type, you know, southern black guy accent who were making fun of Dumbo. I'm remembering like, this now as you time. say it, but it's been so long since I've seen. I saw it when I was a little kid, you know. It's, but yeah, no, there, there's a whole bunch of bullying in Dumbo, and, it, and I can understand the people who don't want to see it. My problem is I, I cannot stand, I, I see, I, you know, a lot of people who watch the, and this is something different, the people who watch the new, the Detective Pikachu, the live action Detective Pikachu trailer, um, they say, oh yeah, it's really uncanny valley at first, but the more you watch it, the, you get used to it. I don't. I always, I always feel off about stuff like this. This is why I don't watch movies like Ted. I can't stand that uncanny valley feeling that it gives me. And, I don't even know I what mean, that means. Even, to be honest with you, what, what is it's when something mean? when something looks real, but there's something just off enough. Do you go? That's not real. Like, uh, have you ever? Did you ever see uh, the Final Fantasy movie, Spirits Within? Yeah. Okay. I see. What how, you're how? Yeah. Yeah. That's Uncanny Valley. That offsetting feeling you get looking at those characters. Or like the uh, the CGI Princess Leia in. Um, oh, uh, exactly. Yeah. Um, like exactly. Something just she little... just she. It was like super impressive that they did this. But she also didn't look quite right. Actually, yeah, I got more disturbed by the Tarkin thing. I actually got well, same thing. By the thing. Same thing. Yeah, they're, same that's, thing. That they're both but, good examples of, of of Uncanny Valley. But see, that's the that's the but thing. That that's, hmm. that's the thing in it too. Those who didn't know that those people were dead went, oh well, those are you know those actors are really good. Then you come to find out those are CGI created actors, and you're like, what? But yeah. those of us who knew saw that and went. And me, I'm sitting here just going, oh, God, I love that they did this, but I just I can't get over this Uncanny Valley sensation. And and I, I, I can't do it with Dumbo either for some strange I, reason, even he's after, not, like, the makeup scene. I, I don't I don't have a problem with, with, with Dumbo because it's... He's all know, CGI. There's a difference. Yeah, I mean, he, well, I mean the, he, there the, never the, the, was the, a real Dumbo, you know? Right. I mean, the, the Pikachu um, and Detective Pikachu is all CGI, and I just, my mind cannot separate that... It just it it 
dwells on that one point and it just disturbs me and i can't it, it, it. doesn't affect I, like when i see the trailer i actually love the way they do it they use the i believe i could be wrong that the mother is a real one, and then they just cgi the part where the tent the trunk is coming out of the the bars so that she can touch her, her son uh but dumbo is obviously all cgi i don't know about the mother it could be cgi but um i i just think that for him because he's supposed to be cute you have to do things with his facial expressions he a real elephant can't do so I think it worked um, because it has to be sort of cartoonish in order for it to really get him to be the character that you want to sim- to be the main protagonist character, um, the one you want to sympathize. Yeah, no, with. I'm not. I'm not saying it has to be realistic. I'm not. That, that's not what I'm saying. I my mind literally just can't get over the CGI aspect and going. Uh, I just I really don't like that. I see what you mean with the other examples because they used a real person. And they, I saw behind the scenes, like with Leia and Tarkin, how they did the, they line up the technology where they, they, they do a map of the face over someone that they pick, they pick an actor or actress whose face is symmetrically similar to the original. Yeah. So that makes it easier to track each shot, each frame uh, yeah. for, for the mapping. But with Dumbo, because he is all CGI, I felt, I didn't know, I didn't, it didn't bother me personally. But, you know, we'll see. I do. Well, I mean, I, I totally get where you're coming from, though, son. I mean, but I think, you know, different people are going to have different levels of, of uh, oh, yeah, no, tolerance I, I, for that, you know? Yeah, yeah no, um, I, I like, see that I'm not a big I'm not a big uh, Pokemon fan, so yeah, I'm, I'm not really invested in, in how yeah. how Pikachu is, uh, is captured. I uh, right. Although I have seen the trailer, and, yeah, and I uh, I'm gonna, I'm there, watch there are a lot of reasons for me, and I'm, I'm just probably the wrong you know, demographic. Uh, it <laughs> doesn't strike me as a, a very entertaining looking movie, sort of like, uh, like the live action, uh, Smurf movies. I was like, ugh, I had no desire to see it, but they were box office big time. So, you know, it's about knowing your audience. I'm clearly not part of the intended audience. So, you know, what I think of it, you know, doesn't really matter. I, I still, to this day, I used to love the Smurfs as a kid, but then I got older and people kept going, but Smurfette's the only Smurfette in a whole village of male Smurfs. Think about it. And I'm like, okay, this she is could weird. lay. She she could literally she could literally lay eggs like a fish. <laughs> you know, there's actually why, why, why a Smurf, have to go? there's actually a Smurf cartoon, and don't ask me why I know this, but in in which they explain that there is actually a separate a separate town of all female Smurfs. They're basically like Amazon <laughs> Smurfs. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. I mean, it's a total retcon because it's a relatively new new uh, f- movie. Uh, it's on Netflix. I forget what it's called. But, oh, know, wow. Just well, put in a- Netflix and Smurfs, you know, female Smurfs, and it'll come up, I'm sure. But, uh, yeah, so, eh. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, so I'm looking forward to it, and not, and not just because of Dumbo himself, although he's cute as hell, but the whole cast. I mean, Eva Green as the mom of the Colin Farrell's family. Um, some people have been talking about this other movie, I can't remember the name of it, that Danny DeVito appeared in with Michael Keaton, where he played a, or no, Big Fish, where he played a, the circus on it, and it was the same time period. So a lot of people are wondering if Tim, and he and Tim Burton did that movie too. So a lot of people are wondering if he's the same character. And uh, I've heard different rumors behind the scenes that he might be. Sort of like non can canonically, like he that he's kind of winking and saying, "Yeah, it could be the same." Well, guy. I'm not, I'm not sure. There's like a big fish canon, really, right. but, but you know, but I think you know this is the kind of thing that filmmakers do as just like Easter eggs. You know, it's like a, a call to. They will probably never ever say anything official right. about it being the case. Um, they just put it in there for people, you know, who notice, might, like, who will appreciate like- it. They might say, hey, you know, I, if people want to think that, I'm not going to say you're wrong. Sometimes, or, but I'm also not going to confirm it either. To be, you you know, know, that's 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 actually something I'd like to have as a weapon in Star Trek Online for the winter event. A big fish cannon. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> shoots, a, shoots the gummy Swedish fish out of it. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> I do like them gummies. Yeah, no, when when they first introduced the Klingon ice fishing, um, the first thing I did was buy the red gummy Swedish fish pet. Did you see that thing? I, 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 get, I don't know if this happened when it actually happened. I saw a thumbnail of uh, something where... Did Patrick Stewart get knighted? 
by the Queen with a bat, or was, did somebody add it with Photoshop? That's Photoshop. Uh, I- I'm pretty sure that's Photoshop. The All right, I didn't know not, if they did that as a Would joke. not lower herself to such a common... <laughs> okay, I thought it was, but I wasn't reference. sure. I'm like, is she actually... I mean, this is the queen we're talking about. Yeah, but sometimes the British are kind of funny that way. They sometimes go jokes like that, even if at the higher levels. Not so the queen. Eh, I don't know. She likes oh, to watch man. the France... She likes to watch the America's... Uh, British, Britain's Got Talent... Winners, See, even if they're like dancing every, dogs and you everybody know. else makes fun of the queen, the queen does not make fun of herself. Uh, that's a good point. The, the royal family has a reputation or an image. Yeah, I, see what I mean, saying. do you remember the Titanic episode of Doctor Who that oh, was making oh, yeah. fun of the queen, but to have the real queen there would have been a fr- an affront to everything? I don't know. This they do sometimes have a good hum- sense of humor, it depends on the situation. But anyways, before, before we leave, before we leave this topic, though, uh, the Uncanny Valley topic, you know, the, the other part of the of the Pikachu uh, movie trailer dropping is how much people are freaking out by uh, by Pokemon with fur. Oh, really? Hmm. Like, oh, yeah. People are like they don't have fur. They're like adamant that Pokemon are not furry creatures. Oh dear. Pikachu God. is not furry. Uh, um, what was the other one? The one with the little curly cue on his head. Um, Jigglypuff uh, is not furry, although he's got a curl. So the curl's got to be made of something kind of hairy. But I, we may be, I may be deep diving a little too much into that. But it's just I mean, funny to me. They literally have bird Pokemon. So they're going to have feathers, right? Well, they have like, you know lizard pokemon so of course yeah. they're gonna have scales but but the main you know the ones that are drawn smooth they they're freaking out that they're making them look furry okay. just, just, uh... you know it's funny in i mean work... you could i i it's the only time in my life i wanted to rub pikachu's tummy in my He's area so i live cute. in um i thought pokemon go would have gone <laughs> by now no no it is nope. going strong i know it is going i strong i was living in a different area uh, about a year ago, I everybody when it first came out, I was working at. In fact, we talked about this before the show started. I was working at Pizza Hut at the time about a year ago, and everybody was like doing Pokemon Go and that mm-hmm. worked there. And I was like, oh god! But then I thought it was over with. It kind of faded out. And then mm-hmm. I moved up where I am now in Lewiston, Maine, and all of a sudden, all around me, there's people still walking around doing their thing, going poke. We got to find Pikachu. Got to find whatever. And I'm like, wow. Never underestimate Nintendo's ability to create or collaborate with people that will get their customer base active. We saw this with the Wii. Oh, wow. That's really, they're freaking out about that. Seriously. The texture. Because that's what yeah, it boils totally, down to. Yeah, the they're freaking out about the texture. Jesus. I mean, I mean, qu- quite literally, the Pokemon, the, the, the Pokedex, the Pokemon Index for Pikachu says mouse Pokemon. Well, I'm sorry. Mice are generally furry. It just goes to show you, I mean, fans, they, they create their own versions of this world that only sometimes intersects with the reality of what's, you know, actually presented about, about these different uh worlds and yeah. so you know it doesn't matter what the creators intended it only matters what's in their head and if it's different from what's in their head then it's obviously wrong and not canonical i mean I, I've, I've, I've said this before funny. with the i've said this before with the people who who are pissed off about what was it they they cast a a, a black lady as uh cersei for the new witcher series no actually Netflix. they didn't that was actually wrong they didn't but anyways go ahead. well i mean just just the rumor of it had people screaming this isn't right and it's like you're thinking of siri not Cersei. all it it's like all it is is skin color it's still the same story and this is a lady who was a princess from far away well i mean you know not only that but to, all the Pokemon stuff, just like with any of those '80s cartoons or Dragon Ball Z and stuff like that, they're drawn in three in two D, and you can't tell. Like, so if they have light fur, you know they they're not gonna like. You know, it's like when they okay. There's a here's an example: the the Bruce Tim Justice League Unlimited Batman the animated series and all that. Uh, back when they did that, um, I remember watching an interview with him. 
and he talked about Zatanna in uh, when they brought her into the Justice League Unlimited. Uh, I think he was all, she was also in Batman the Animated Series, but they she usually wears fishnet stockings. The fishnet, you know, the actual fishnet stockings. Well, when you see her in the cartoons, it's a smooth nylon. It's like a one, like the, the same tone color, but not the the um, the the pattern of the fishnet. Okay, and the reason why is because when you do two D drawings, it makes it harder to animate when you have to do all the little crossy fishnet stuff. So they just make it smooth. Intentionally, though, in your head cannon, you're supposed to. Think but this it, is the reverse. Is you it know, the reverse? The, yeah, the reverse is is that you've got this stuff that's smooth. That if you if you stay true to what you see in in two D animation, it's going to look just weird. That, on, right, you right. Know, that, on that's screen and uh, live action. Uh, look at the Mister Mime in the trailer. Well, that's what I meant. Like it, you, for them to say that he didn't have fur. Okay, if it's very, it's the fur I'm seeing in the textures on these animations is very light, like almost bunny rabbit type fur. It's not like. You know, yeah, but you, it's it's not smooth. That's the point. It doesn't matter that it's right. light. It matters that it's there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Right, can, right. I, can, I, can I mention one other thing about this? Sure. The 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 person that they got to um, uh, concept art all of the Pokemon or most of the Pokemon for this for this movie has been a uh, fan artist of Pokemon for like ever. Interesting. So, uh, for those of you who who think fan art isn't a career out there, you moms and dads, yes, it actually can be. No, it can be. They, I've seen several examples where they took a fan. Look at um, Peter Capaldi's opener for Doctor Who. They actually paid the original guy that did the fan thing to help them come up with the new version. Uh, I don't think that's true, actually. No, it is. It's I think confirmed. that... Uh, I don't know if they, uh, I'm going to uh, check that out again. I, I heard that it was... That they, well, I don't know. I'll, that they I'll were inspired up. by. Well, the guy he, on his channel, he mentioned it. He talked about it. They did actually bring him on board to help, and they and he, they did something for him. I don't know if they paid him. They didn't have to. They were obviously not obligated because he did something with an IP that wasn't his. But I think they did. They did. They worked with him out of respect for the fact that the people seemed they loved what he did. Uh, that, you know. I just remember the story when it happened. Everybody was like happy about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Continue to do. They your didn't have to do it. They didn't have to do it. Bring us, and bring us some hot link. Well, it wasn't. You know, I can, but okay. So no, you don't have to do it now. Just yeah, just just yeah. Right. If, if if you if you think it, that well, that's no, I remember the posting yeah, this on the on that Time Lord group that we're part of. I remember this was a yeah. subject. You know, yeah. Um, if you it's just been a while. Again, just yeah, bring it back up. So the next big topic that uh, well, well, okay. So I looked this up while right, while you two were talking, and right. they did not bring the guy in. Stephen Moffat saw it and he used it as the basis for what were the actual season eight opening credits. And if you compare they were the done, two, though, well, because they were inspired by them, right? He right. said he used it as, but he didn't bring the guy in. He just they did their own and you know, based on, on the work that the fan did, which is great. I mean, I think that's fantastic. Um, but it, but it wasn't like they hired the dude to do it. Um, oh, he right. just that did it, they liked it and okay. said, we're going to do it. We're going to do one similar to that because we think that's a good concept. Well, they at least and, acknowledged him. Oh yeah, totally. Totally. Which is good. Which is great. I mean, yeah. I don't know if they paid. Probably not. They didn't probably give him any money. But you know, but they did at least acknowledge him. And I, if I was that guy, I would be happy enough with that too. You know, so. So what you're I'm, saying is, it's a case of art imitating art, imitating art, imitating time and space. Sometimes fans can make stuff that's better. I actually think his openers were better than the one they ended up using. In my opinion. You know, I don't remember them. Oh, don't clearly, get into it. But. Um, I think I remember thinking the same thing. No, it was. It was better. I, I, it was short. Their version was shorter. I think that's why they picked their own version. But his version. Well, at least we're all agreed that the current seasons is awesome. Yes. Yes, especially. Uh, I, I'm only going to say tonight's episode with the Kerblam. We'll talk about that in the next reaction. Who? Uh, but. Uh, Great, awesome episode. Um, you say that, and the only thing running through my head is Action League now. <laughs> so let's talk about Stan Lee. 
So, unfortunately, uh, you know, he's not, he was 95 years old. It was bound to happen sooner or later. Um, I hate when people go, this is the worst year ever because we lost this person and this person. Um, unfortunately, people die. Uh, that's just life. But when you're 95 years old and you have the kind of legacy that this man left behind, that's a pretty badass way to go. If you it's, ask like, uh, it's like David Bowie passing away. We also have one more uh, after credit scene coming for at the end of, I think, Captain Marvel, uh, at least. Uh, maybe even Avengers 4 that he already did ahead of time. So there's more to see of Stan Lee before this is all said and done. Yeah, I think... Um, I think um... There's several They're going to posthumously cameo have, him, yeah. like like forever. He's going to be the new Tupac. But he did actually film at least one or two more things. They've oh, yeah, already, sure, yeah. Either I think it was Captain Marvel and Avengers Four, or one or the other. But it might have been both. I think it was both. Can, can I just say I am so glad he had some measure of peace in the weeks before he passed away, because this year has been nuts and a whole lot of hell for Stan Lee. Yeah, like the whole thing about the nursing home and the way they Well, were no, him. I mean not even that. The no, he no, his his I think it was his manager at the time or his handler at the time was a guy named Kia Morgan. And this is a guy who literally like in court documents stole Stanley's blood and used it to sign stamps in Stanley's name to send to fans or to sell for his own personal gain. I never he heard about filed that. A, he, filed a restrain, he filed a restraining order, quote-unquote, on behalf of Stan Lee against Stan Lee's own daughter, uh, in which these wild accusations were made that, uh, that she was abusing her father and her father's fortune and all of this stuff and, and laid this groundwork for... Uh, she would never get to touch any but any of Stanley's fortune, and basically, Kia Morgan was setting up these pieces for controlling Stanley's fortune himself. And it well, wasn't until like a couple of months ago that it was really all it, it really all exploded in Kia Morgan's face. Well, I'm glad it got resolved. But uh, speaking of Stanley and his daughter, they did reveal that they before he died they've had they have created one more original superhero together him and his daughter that they haven't revealed who it is yet as far as i know but it's going uh, to be it was called dirt man oh was it i didn't know yeah. if they'd revealed the character yet yeah that, that's that, cool yeah, though. the character was called dirt man and i don't really know the specifics just that it was called dirt man well just to give a little background um just stanley um in, in some of the just a few examples Spider-Man, the X-Men, Iron Man, Thor, the Hulk, Fantastic Four, Black Panther, Daredevil, Doctor Strange, Ant-Man, and so much more. He also was, uh, he challenged the restrictions of the Comic Code Authority, uh, and during the 80s, um, they, he, he was approached by, he was approached to do an episode, uh, not an episode, a comic issue, where he did, um, something to, uh, against the war on drugs. This is in the 1971 or two. And the comic code authority said they would not endorse this, but he did it anyways. Uh, and he was able to get it published. It was an issue of Spider-Man where one of his friends got addicted to some prescription drugs. And he was, he, he agreed that he needed to help with the whole message about don't do drugs. And, he, the Comic Code's authority would not approve it and put their stamp on it because it involved drugs. But he said, well, whatever. And he got it published anyways. It got, he got praised for saying, screw you, Comic Code Authority, and doing this anyways for trying to make a difference. That's the kind of guy he was. And he was also very anti-discrimination. Um, he was a great man. I mean, he was ahead of his time. And I don't know. Carlos, what do you think of Stanley? Well... I think there's no there's no doubt that he has been one of the major creative forces of the 20th century. I mean, he and 21st century, you know, and and maybe the 22nd. Uh, I think it, I think his creations will that have that kind of lasting impact. Um, so I think I think it's um, uh, sad that he that he passed. Uh, he lived a long and fruitful life, which I think is great. Um, I will tell you, however, I grew up a DC fan. Uh, I came as to Marvel I, late in later in my life, and uh, as such, I was often driven crazy by how 
much of a cult of personality, it seemed to me. Now, this is Carlos at like 10 and 11, okay? <laughs> um, there seemed to be around around this guy um, and, and Marvel Comics and his Stan Soapbox. And it all seemed to be about me, me, me. And that just it left kind of a bad taste in my mouth. Again, this is me at 11. Um, you know, as, as time went on, obviously, I, I finally got into, into Marvel Comics uh, about the time I, I started college, so around 17. And, um, you know, and I, I loved Marvel Comics ever since. So I certainly, um, I certainly see the value that he has, has offered to, to culture, to pop culture. Um, and, uh, you know, he was, a, he was a great man. He influenced a lot of other artists. Um, you know, I was uh, just uh, communicating with a friend of mine who's a comic book artist who uh, published on his Instagram a picture of him with Stan Lee back in the 90s. And he made a point of, Stan Lee uh, made a point of coming over to him and saying, you know, I've seen your work and I really like it. And he was like, I thought he wouldn't know me from Adam, but he, he did. And I thought that was just a really nice anecdote that, you know, illustrated the kind of, of man that he was, you know, that he that he took note of people's hard work and and went out of his way to uh to uh congratulate them on it and i, th I think that's a a telling story you know it's funny um one of the one of the best stories i always loved about reading about was the rivalry between stanley and i forget the guy's name that was in charge of dc at the time they had a rivalry over the years where they had to one up one another like dc made swamp thing so stanley made man thing uh, DC made the Doom Patrol, so Stanley made the X Men. Um, they were always trying to like go, oh, I can one up you, I can one up. You. So, for example, when they made the Justice League, as a response, he made the Fantastic Four, and then he made the Avengers. But as a response, he said, I'm not going to just do one superhero team; I'll do two. His wife encouraged him to do that. Actually, it's a true story. Um, and they've been together; they had been together for 70 years. But um, it was funny; just they they kept one up one upping one another. It, it, all through the years and it led to some of the greatest group characters like on both sides of the border you might say in history uh, as far as comic books um so it was because of that rivalry that friendly rivalry uh stanley did did however say and he went on record as saying that no matter what characters marvel creates he will always consider because because they've had crossover stories like the team ups like justice league versus avengers or i remember one of the issues i read is spider-man superman and Spider-Man, and then he fought the Incredible Hulk, and the Hulk got his ass kicked really easily by Superman, and the fans went crazy. Like, yeah, you have to rem you have to remember that back then crossovers never happened. Crossovers happen now quite a bit in popular culture, but back then it was unheard of. And these two right. comics companies were were rivals, and most of their fans were you know bitter <laughs> enemies um so it was a big deal yeah. when when these uh, crossovers and, um, happened and plus they published them in like super big uh, format like a tabloid size format right Do you remember uh, as opposed to yeah the regular sort of eight and a half by 11 sized uh, uh comic book so they were they were a big deal he did say though that he recognizes he said this once and people forgot he said, uh, no matter what characters are, are made in Marvel, in the Marvel Universe, he is, his official stance was, there, if there is ever a crossover, there, was an, there would be no more, no character in Marvel would be more powerful than DC Superman, because he had that much respect for the character. And he said, he is all these people at Marvel that, you know, even, although it's questionable, and with, with the you century, could argue that Phoenix is more is more. Powerful I would argue than that Superman. Sentry, the Sentry, is to me like the one you want to watch out. He, but whenever he's gone up against things like even Thor, even though he had the magic hammer, he did ultimately beat Thor. But the thing is, is that his his opinion was, I mean, he he was out of, it wasn't in his control completely. But Superman should always be respected as the top dog that started all the comic wonder, even though it started with DC. Um, but anyways, so Stanley and they had a friendly rivalry. That was awesome. Um, now, I want to take a second to talk about, and I don't want to give this a hell of a lot of time, but. Okay, okay. The, well, well before, you, before, you go off, before you go off on that one, can I just say. Go ahead. Fuck you, you accusing woke ass Twitter people. Fuck you. This is like, oh, you saw it when Stanley died. Oh, Stanley died. Rip, 20 minutes later. Okay. 
Stanley was problematic. Fuck you, people. And speaking of problematic... Unproven allegations across the board, calling him a racist because, oh, I don't know, he wants the king of Wakanda to be black and the king of Wakanda. Like, what? What, yeah. what, the, what the hell are you people talking about? In posterity, nobody... In posterity, no one's going to agree with that. But let's talk about Bill Mar, Mar whatever you want to pronounce his name is. I don't really care if I get it right at this point. I don't respect him. I have always been on the fence about how I felt about this guy, but Jesus Christ. Really, Bill Mar? I mean, son. What, like, what, what did he do? I didn't hear. Oh, you didn't hear about this? He created, he, 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 posted, a, he posted his own op-ed in one of the online magazines, I guess. But it was basically he was using he was using uh, Stanley to say uh, as an excuse uh, as an excuse to say we have become so stupid that adults now think comic books are uh, basically novel class literature. He blamed Trump, and uh, that, Trump being and elected that on that because comic of this fans. dumb and that because of this dumbing down is how we got President Trump into office. Well, I like I like Bill Maher's point of view on on a lot of things. I I would say that I don't agree with him on this one. Um, Look it up while we're talking. I'm yeah, telling you, you're going to feel think, there's a lot of outrage right now. It, there's more yeah, to than what um, Justin just said. It's a lot more to it. Yeah, no, I understand what the what the what the issue is. Um, you know, it's not the first time in American history that comic books have been blamed for things, you know, way above their pay grade. Um, so, you know, in fact, the Comics Code Authority that you talked about just a little while ago was a perfect example of that. It, it was created uh, as a, a backlash against uh, what comic books were doing. And, um, you know, in, in the 50s when everything got super conservative and uh, comics, you know, that's – it was later retconned that that's why the, you know, Justice Society disappeared because uh, because of, of the politics of the 50s and, and McCarthyism and whatever, and they just sort of disappeared. Um, and, you know, only to be reborn later as, as the Justice League. And um, – you know, so it was it was a sign of the times where, you know, public paranoia about the effect comic books were having on on kids and on, you know, the larger culture is something we've we've seen before. And, um, you know, it doesn't surprise me that we're seeing it again. Um, I think that um, there's there's not a lot of, uh, you know, I, I don't think he can offer a lot of evidence uh, to, to back up what what he's saying. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of people who, uh, you know, went into politics, went into public service, who went it specifically because of the morals that they picked up from comic books. You know, um, I myself was accused by a friend in college of having a comic book morality, and I remember I uh, I said back to him, "If that's the the worst thing you could say about me, that's probably the best thing you could say about me." <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so I I don't know. I I'm not gonna put up too much of a kerfuffle about this other than to just say I dis disagree with him and that he's, you know, trying to make uh, comic books the fall guy for, you know, a l much I deeper actually, problems in our society than comic books encompass. I heard I heard something really something that really got me thinking uh, the other day when I was watching a video about this specific, this, this exact topic and the person who was talking, uh, speaking about it said, when I was, when I was younger and a lot more, a lot more liberal than I am now, I used to think Bill Maher was amazing. And then I grew up and realized Bill Maher is not a smart man. He's just a man who says stupid shit in a smart way. <laughs> Well, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't go I, so I've, far. I've, I've I mean, I'm glad fence. I'm glad he's out there. I mean, I'm glad he's uh, he he does his show. I mean, I disagree with him on this. I think it was oh, yeah, ill-timed no. and tone deaf. And, he's been and right wrong. about some things. I'll give him that. But I just feel that like he, he really was. You know, if you get a chance, read some of these things that he said. There's they, oh, people... well, here, here's the thing. I'm not. I, you know, I I, I don't necessarily agree with that sentiment at the same time i can i can understand it from a lot of people who see bill maher as this kind of sham but at the same time on the left bill maher is kind of the only guy we have left because everybody else has been drummed out for being problematic or uh 
or a sexual harasser or accused of this or oh, that. Oh, we've got plenty of people the... on the left. We got plenty of people on the left. I mean, there's no dearth of entertainers on the on the have, left. He, he I'm, not, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about an entertainer. I'm talking about someone who is willing to to challenge, like political ideas but the problem is is that when you are uh, in a position like his and you have his soapbox you pick a time right after an icon dies to to do this th it's you have to have some integrity no and yeah no that that's that's the biggest sticking point is why did you have to wait until after he died if this was your excuse the whole time why the hell weren't you making it before yeah well at least it would have been consistent look you guys i mean it's a news hook it's not like he he was sitting on these ideas you know for decades it's like oh stan lee died gosh this makes me think about you know as i think about this guy and his impact on society what really was that impact in society and oh i see some problems there so i'm going to talk about it i mean I think it's I think it's overblowing it to to say somehow that he was wrong for waiting until now to say something about I it. Mean, it probably didn't occur to him till, till well, his HBO, death. Because... H but hold on, HBO is funding his show, right? So here's the problem: they have the upcoming Watchmen show, so he has to be careful what he says about superheroes. He also took a paycheck for being in Iron Man uh, two or three, I think it was. Was it two? I forget which one. I, but, I don't think comic book fans are going to like, are going know. to boycott Watchmen because of Bill Maher. No, no, no. I what mean, I'm saying is HBO. Come on. No, no, no. It's not that. I just think that HBO should be like if well, they're no, doing no, a no, 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 they, no. They shouldn't, George. No, they shouldn't. They they shouldn't. They shouldn't do it. Let him do his own thing. This isn't the yeah, first he's time he's doing his own thing. This is the first. This isn't the first time Bill Maher has stepped in shit and then stuck his foot in his mouth. Because oh, that, he that literally is... did that on his show before by saying, oh, no, 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 I'm a house N-word. Yeah, his, his words about Muslims have caused problems, too. But I'm just saying, that, like, HBO, if they're making, it's in, I'm just saying, they're making a superhero show that everybody's looking forward to. And then he's sitting there going, if people worshiping superheroes now is stupid. And that kind of, I don't know. So I mean, what? I, so what? So, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. expect, you're, I don't you're, expect you're... every single person that appears on HBO to follow some company line about something. I mean, yeah, that's you know, true. John Oliver is, is out there, too, saying stuff that a lot of people disagree with. And, you know, thank God he does. Is I mean, he thank God that HBO makes. Yeah. Let's, oh, I, I mean, thank God HBO makes room for a lot of different kinds of opinions out there, especially those that speak truth to power. I think that's great. I, I think they're a strong enough brand when it comes to their shows and the entertainment they create for pure entertainment that it doesn't matter what Bill Maher says. It doesn't matter what John Oliver says. They're going to do the Watchmen and peep and it will it and it will rise or fall based on its own merits, not because of some offhand blog by by Bill Maher. I, I think you, the, the biggest problem here is that that people are upset for for. People are upset for a thing that they don't realize that they're upset for, so they're trying to find something else that they can easily latch on to. Yeah, and I the think thing it's is, just a timing. Well, 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 here, here's the thing. What Bill Maher is attacking is that he does not understand comic books as escapism. I mean, you, you do the same thing when you go to the movies to watch a superhero movie. It is escapism. It is, a, it is a time and a place for you to sit down and forget about everything and enjoy something you enjoy solely because you can let everything go. And Bill Maher does not understand that about comic books. And I, and I don't hold that against him. But to rail because he doesn't understand it is a fundamental problem because he is now attacking he now seems like he's attacking a whole bunch of people who use comic books as a form of escapism but they don't realize that's what he's attacking them over or perceiving to be attacked over well there's a there's a couple of things going on there first of all co comics are not monolithic they're not just one thing they're comics that are made for for kids purely for young kids they're comics for tweens they're comics for teenagers they're comics for adults so the idea that somehow you can pass judgment on all comics um you know and characterize them all in the same way i think is is uh, uh is not you know it's, it's not a very incisive way of of uh, analyzing um, what what the medium does. I mean, the medium has produced some amazing things that I think are legitimate uh, uh, literature. I mean, Mouse, yeah. for example, is uh, is amazing. There's um, 
uh, Persepolis is, is amazing. Um, uh, the the graphic novel that Fun Home uh, is based on, um, the Broadway show is based on, is is amazing. There's been a lot of of uh, incredible literature that has been produced coming out of comics, and uh, to dismiss an entire medium because I'm not even sure why. I mean, well, you well, I mean, he basically it. calls it childish, and that we we as adults are supposed to get rid of childish things, and it's like, uh, hold up, wait a minute, you yourself just went to see this amazing 2D animation thing in a movie. Uh, I'm sorry, aren't cartoons for kids? Isn't that well, the big whole thing that people talk about all the damn time that cartoons I, are for kids, and you just went to see another Studio Ghibli film? Uh, you know, I remember, me. I remember Hot when, uh, kettle. When Sean Connery did uh, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, I mean, I'll never forget an interview he had. Um, I'm not sure who it was with. It might have been David Letterman. Um, but um, he talked about how he had never read a comic book in his life. And in order to do the role of the character he played in uh, Alan Quarterman in The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, he was required to read the graphic novels. And he thought to himself, what? I'm, I, 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 and then he read them. And he was he on record as saying, I never knew that you could re- that you could have funny pages with great stories if it was a novel because he read a graphic novel and he said I it blew my mind he he exp- he said how he never realized that there's this um there's this predisposed um bias out there about how um people assume a comic book is for kids and it's silly stuff you know but he goes he read it and he was like this is just as deep as reading an actual Shakespeare thing or something like major yeah, like yeah, that. The same, the same discussion is it going just on pictures. right now in the. The same you know? discussion is going on right now in the gaming community and it has been for years. Can yeah, we take can, games oh, yeah, seriously? Yeah, yeah. Well, but they're for kids, aren't they? Well, no. Have you played an Assassin's Creed game? Red Dem, Re- Red Dead Re- Redemption. When I watch the yeah. cutscenes for that entire game, it blows my mind. It's so the, everything. It's it's like a different medium. But anyways, you you get my point. But f- Bill Murr is coming out. Of ignorance is my opinion. So his, but he. The thing is, he has a big soapbox, and I, I just, it's a shame. Well, you know what? He has a debate show. I'm hoping somebody from Marvel or care, someone will go on and debate with him about this. Kind of like when he had Ice Cube on after saying the house. I mean, he does. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if he did. I wouldn't be surprised I would, if he I did. Look, the guy's, he's open-minded. He's wrong about the th- some things. I mean, there's th- things he he's says I don't agree with, but I am glad things, but, yeah. he's there. I'm glad he does this show every week. I'm glad he takes power to task. I'm glad he he uh, invites you know Republicans as well as Democrats to be guests on his show and to, to comment on things. I'm glad he yeah, does that. Yeah, but let's be fair. I'm he sorry he did this one this thing, but... To, yeah. Well... He, it's his opinion. He's not. No, 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 no. That's not what I mean. When he brings them on his show, he's what expressing I mean is, his opinion. No, what I mean is. I'm that sorry. Bring, go ahead. Say. Oh, what I meant was when he brings the other side on his show, he lets them talk, but he often ends up overpowering them, like as if to just put them in the spotlight so that he can bully them a little bit. But that's just my opinion. I, I don't think that's true. That's yeah, not I've seen my a couple. With, I have seen a couple um, of exceptions. I. I I do agree. Well, of that. course, there are always exceptions. There's some people who are assholes on his show, and so he's an yeah, asshole back, true. you know. Yeah. But for the most part, if you behave yourself, he treats you with not respect. Was an asshole on his show. Oh <laughs> yes, I saw that one. Wait, which one? Wait, which one? Uh, uh, Milo, Milo Yiannopoulos is a conservative oh, provocateur. Yeah. Yep. Or Ann and Coulter, he literally, comes he's literally shoving Milo Yiannopoulos in the leg, going stop. I love it whenever he has Ann Coulter on there. That's that's always my. My go-to if you want to see a good verbal boxing match. But, um, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, so, I, I mean, obviously, Stan Lee, his legacy is going to overpower Bill Maher. Bill Maher is, he, he can say what, he, he has free speech. I mean, we just, we just saw a lot of with the cost of things. That free speech needs to happen. I mean, we can't shut them up. We want them, we want people to say what they need to say. But, at the same time, Stan Lee's legacy is... forks and torches already. Well, I think Stan Lee's. Um, no, I haven't. I haven't experienced that. Uh, either people don't listen enough to us to get an opinion about that. No, they do actually, according to my analyst analytics, um, or they agree and they just don't say anything. But the um, the thing is, is that the the audience of Bill Maher and his reach um, versus the totality of Marvel 
is he is he is um way overshadowed. So okay, he spoke up, he got his opinion, but I don't think it's gonna affect anything. Um so therefore it's fine. You can get that opinion out there. But but it is but it is affecting things because we're talking about it right now. I guess I suppose that's true. Well, and that's the whole race. point, isn't it? I mean, the whole point is for us to talk about things. I mean, not just us to invite here the discussion. today, yeah. but yeah, that pe for, people should be free to, to air their opinion and then people should be free to discuss it without calling names and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, that's that's when a democracy works best. You know, the, the well, answer to bad speech is not asshole, is but... not preventing speech. It's it's more speech. And so more speech. Yeah, I, I I agree with you in general. Um, I think there are going to be some people more offended than others, obviously, like his family, people that have worked with him. They're going to take more offense to what he said. Um, but at the end of the day, I do actually think you made a valid argument about considering other things, the bigger picture. Which is well, I mean, the bigger, the bigger picture is we do live in a society that's getting dumbed down in a lot of ways. I don't think it's because of comic books, but it's a it's a real concern. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the complete abandonment of, uh, of logic and the scientific method by a significant portion of, of American society is something we should be worried about. Um, so it's a, it's a, uh, an issue that we should be talking about. He it's, just happened to choose the, the, the wrong target to make, uh, to use to make his point. You know, that's true. In fact, Son and I talked about this, um, the other day before you showed up. Uh, for for a reaction, who? Because uh, um, Sun often can say some strongly opinionated things in political things on Facebook, <laughs> and I've had she well, does she does. It's weird. And then I've had so many people be like, "Why are you still friends with her?" Because they're only reacting to what they see in texts in, uh, her based on her sometimes long winded reactions to uh, responses to things in posts. And it's like I told her, like, I, I don't have a problem with saying her friend disagreeing with something she says in a political argument it doesn't mean it's like if i was offline with you guys right now if you lived in my town uh you wouldn't want to live here but if just in general let's pretend there's a town called i've been mm -hmm. to your town oh have you all right i'm sorry to hear that but say we lived in a town called pretendsville okay and it was a sort of like riverdale i guess um and we hung out at the at pop's shop and we had some milkshakes and we just got done arguing about something somewhere else about politics and talked about you know i said one thing about say trump and she said another and you said another and we talked about bill maher and all this other stuff we can yell at each other all we want on facebook but it doesn't mean i'm not going to be your friend but the problem with today's society is that for people who have especially for, especially actually no not just people who know each other only on Facebook. I've actually lost more friends from the people I know on offline, for my opinion. See, that's that's the thing. The the we should be able the, to talk it out and just say whatever. We're still friends. We just disagree about this. The in person, the impersonality. That's that's the big thing. Social media has brought us all together, but it has physically pulled us all apart because the impersonality of being on a platform like Facebook where we can discuss these ideas means oh well I don't have to hear that person anymore because that person is just wrong well block. not just that you can block me and I can block you yeah you that's, that's that's yeah that's that's, that's the whole point you might run into each other it's a little different well and that's that's where the rubber meets the road for the arguments for 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 having a discussion and see that's the problem we're having right now in the United States where we have people that say Hey, I want to, I want to be able to speak freely and us have a discussion. And another group goes, "You're just a fucking Nazi," and it, it does it does not it does not promote any sort of debate. It shuts down debate when you a name and accuse and then go out and beat a Jewish man just because he came out of the bathroom. I've stayed I've stayed at places uh, where I had neighbors who who were complete like. When I was staying at a, a, a vet's place uh, when I was homeless, before I got my place, obviously you're going to see both sides of the issue. Sometimes with veterans, especially the older ones, they're going to be more likely to be pro-Trump because they're old school, okay? Surprisingly, not always. But um, the thing is, we could, just, we could sit down in the lounge downstairs uh, sometimes. Um, I would walk out of my apartment and go downstairs. And people would read in the paper. They're old school. They didn't want to just look at their phones. They would get the paper. They would deliver the paper there. And they'd be talking about what Trump did today and whatever. 
and we would have a discussion. Now, some, yeah. some, a couple of them would be like, well, I don't care what you say. I'm all Trump. Make America great again. And a couple of us other guys would be like, yeah, but you're not seeing the bigger picture. We'd, we'd get into a, a healthy debate. But we wouldn't go, oh, I'm never going to talk to you again. Don't even come knocking on my door. You know what I mean? It was like we could actually have a conversation, agree to disagree, and move on. And we could, you know, still hang out. And see, that's 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 another that's another part of this problem. It is that we we don't have helicopter parents. You know, we 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 now don't have helicopter parents. We have bulldozer parents. That every yeah, obstacle yeah. in a person's way is literally smashed for them. So when they come to when they come in contact with their first conflict ever in real life, they don't know how to handle it. So what is well, it? Sure, it's violent. But- but it's not just young people we're seeing do this. We're seeing plenty of old people who behave exactly yeah. this way. This is not we just are. the province of of millennials or whatever. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not. I don't mean it. I don't mean it that that specific way. But we we are seeing this this childishness that is like that. So that anything anything that you say that I disagree with is violence against me. Bullshit. Real Just life again. is full of disagreements and obstacles, and you're going to have to learn to get to accept some of them and get over the rest. What's that song? Anything you can do, I can do better. I don't remember which from. It's from That's the book. one. All right, let's move on because I could talk about this all day, and I don't want to have the whole podcast be a big debate about something political. So something uh, pseudo political. Yeah, pseudo political because it was. Well, is there awful. anything else either of you wants to say about Stan Lee before we move on? Yes, I do. Excelsior. Ah, that was the only thing about the Stan soapbox that I liked when when I was eleven year old, Carlos. I loved the term Excelsior, and then I looked it up and found out that it was like wood shavings that were used the way we use, uh, you know, bubble wrap today. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's not as cool. Uh, speaking of bubble wrap, you're gonna the new Doctor Who episode is gonna make you look at bubble wrap a whole new way. I'm just saying. I um, saw that in the. I saw that in the. Uh, uh, that excerpt that we looked that we talked about. Oh, uh, it becomes a bigger reaction. issue later. Yeah, it becomes. Oh, bigger. I'm sure it is. It was pretty funny. Yeah, but um, no, but Excelsior actually means something like ever upward. I looked it up earlier. Um, yeah, it does. But it's also wood shavings that used to be used. Oh, for is it? Materials. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of funny actually. It's basically yeah, it's basically the bubble wrap for his for his soapbox. Well, you know, I yeah. used to love yeah. reading. The, okay, here's the difference between Marvel. And I'll say real quick because Carlos and I are both DC fans. Whenever I read a Marvel comic, the first page would always have a little, above the pa- first panels on the pages, it would be a little banner that always had some kind of a statement that Stan Lee made about Spider-Man, the Hulk, anybody. And then it would end with Excelsior and it would it, with his Stan Lee. You know, it, it was kind of neat. It was a little bit pompous, but at the same time, it was kind of neat. It was his little stamp. On the but, whole okay, thing. so 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 Stanley's Stanley's bookcases uh, uh, for for this kind of stuff were, hey there, true all you true believers, all you out true there. believers, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then Excelsior, right? Well, he would always say something about the characters are a little brief thing about how Peter Parker was bitten by a spider. So you you know it was kind of a brief synopsis of what you're about to read. If you never read Spider Man, this is the first issue you're picking up. He was kind of explaining to you what happened. Like he got bit, he became a spider. Man, uh, man thing, swamp experiment, blah blah blah. He became a swamp thing. Um, you know, the Hulk, he got gamma radiation, blah blah blah. Or this person, Donald Blake, picked up the and he found the hammer of the mighty god Thor, blah 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 blah. But he did something as a little preface to sort of give you a brief explanation so he can also throw in Excelsior, you know, and it was just his little stamp. It was cool. I liked it. But By the way, do- his uh. His rival at DC was Julius Schwartz. Oh, was it? Yeah. yeah, and they were always one upping one another. I remember. I just remember that like he came up with Swamp Thing, and Stanley is like, "Well, I'm going to come up with Man Thing." And I just remember it was always like one. They were always similar to one another. All the characters. So you come up with Doctor Strange. You come up with. I'm not sure if it was Zatanna at the time or somebody else, but Doctor Fate maybe. He would, they were they would always try to do something similar, and they didn't try to sue each other. That was the thing. The, the characters might have been very similar to one another, but it was a friendly rivalry, so they didn't go through well, losses. And, well, it's not even it's not even that the, that that was that at that point DC and Marvel were were winning. Were, were oh, where does what is the word? What is the word? They were like doing everything that capitalism says it is idealistically about. They had two very similar characters. 
at the same exact time, and they let the readers decide who was financially going to make one succeed and the other fail. Well, no, it was a response thing, though. It was like one right. Character... It was it was a response, just like there's Pepsi and Coca Cola. Right, because Doom Patrol came out, and a lot of people think that tight uh, Doom Patrol copied uh, X Men. It was the other way around. It was Doom Patrol came out first, and then what happened was the guy that was writing Doom Patrol actually jumped ship over to Marvel and helped create the X Men, and that's why they ended up canceling and killing off the Doom Patrol because. X Men started because it's the same guy who created them, but he wasn't getting paid enough by D, uh, DC. So he went over to Marvel because they made him a better offer and they were paying him more. So he ended up taking the same mental ideas and transforming them into the X Men. And then when they started burying the Doom Patrol in sales, they decided to kill. They killed. Ended up. They, again, well, they took Rita Paul, but well, you know. again, again, this is this is this is capitalism at work. That's true. That's a good point. So. So that's my final word on that, and I'm getting ready to move on to the next subject unless anybody else has anything else to say about Stan. No, let's move ahead. All right. So, John Cryer, 80s, like, you know, icon. Is Ducky. About, Ducky is about to be our, our Lex Luthor in the CW universe. Um, what do we think about this, uh, Carlos? I'm pro. Um, I've always liked John Cryer. Um, I thought he wasted a lot of his talent in... Uh, what was the sitcom he was on with Charlie Sheen? Um, oh, Two and a Half Men. Yeah, Two and a Half Men. Um, but he, you know, he's brilliant as a as a teen actor, um, and I was I've always liked him. So I was glad to see um, that that he's going to be Lex Luthor. I think he's going to give it a shot. He was actually just in, um, uh, I think, the last episode of Will and Grace, playing Abraham Lincoln of all things. Oh, really? And uh, and he knocked it out of the park. So I'm I'm glad you know he's still getting work. I, I people were talking about, and I'll talk about this on a separate subject. The guy who played Fisk on Kingpin in Daredevil. Everybody's like, make him Lex Luthor, and I'm like, no, that would be God, totally, no. totally wrong. Because John Cryer is perfect. Because what Lex Luthor should not be this big, just because he's bald. They think that that's, how, that's the only reason they say this. And I don't want that. Well, like no, saying, it's not even. Well, it's not even that. Well, that's like the, saying the Joe Rogan. Plays, let's make him well, Lex Luthor. You well, know, the, thi the the thing the thing about the thing about the guy playing Fisk and the acting around Fisk is that he he mimics Lex Luthor and that he's yeah sure he's bald but he's an in, he's an intimidating presence. On but Lex Luthor was never a physical. He no, wasn't. no, that yeah, no, that's not that's not what I'm saying. That that a lot of the people who are saying him is because his presence is intimidating, and that was L Lex Luthor's whole shtick was that he he could stand there in a room and command authority just by standing there. Most sure, the, and yeah. the, the thing to remember, by the way, is that the actor who plays uh, Fisk, Vincent D'Onofrio, is not bald in real life. He, well, I understand he that. shaved yeah. his head for, for for the role. So there's nothing about being bald that predisposes you to being able to 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 appear as Lex Luthor. Well, that just goes to show how much I know. I didn't know. I wasn't aware of this actor before uh, Daredevil. But he, he looks he, – he's a perfect kingpin. But all I'm saying is that when people say, like, okay, look, the guy who played um, Michael Ross Rosenberg, Rosenbaum – in Smallville, he was a great Lex Luthor, but he wasn't physically intimidating. Like you wouldn't go, he wouldn't walk into a bar and have people worried about you know, fight with him. You know what I mean? His 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 uh, intimidation uh, came from his his aura, his presence, the way he talked, the commanding presence, sort of like what Sun said. But it wasn't a physical intimidation. Sure, but I don't think you're really hearing anybody call for that here. I've heard it, I've you? heard a few people. I have heard a lot of people say they wanted the guy who played Kingpin to play. Lex, well, that's uh, just because all they're seeing is a bald head. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know? Now, as far as John Cryer, um, Gene Hackman was an awesome Lex Luthor. Well, sort of. Um, he was a comedic Lex Luthor. Um, yeah, I thought he was fine as Lex Luthor. So, and Kevin Spacey, although his opinion of Kevin Spacey has changed since, for a lot of people, since certain things came out. But the, but in Superman Returns, I didn't think he was bad as Lex Luthor. I think there, are, you know, there's a lot of actors who can pull it off. Um, I'm interested to see how John Cryer is going to play this. I hope he does a better job um, because they picked a comedian again. Uh, who was the guy that played him in the movies? Uh, the recent guy. 
from Jesse Memphis. Eisenberg. Yeah, uh, worst Lex Luthor in history, in my opinion. Um, you, I thought he was decent. I hated him. You know, it was a diff. It was a different you take go for on it. But just bipolar, like or, or whatever, autistic, um, Sabat, whatever you want to look at it. He's. That I think that's a, a valid interpretation. I think. I think it's. It's. It makes uh, manic uh, Sabat. Whatever spectrum, you know, but that's the, his version of Lex. Sure, and I think it's valid to explore that kind of motivation be behind how this guy ended up being a a, a supervillain. I mean, I, one of the things I liked about you could, you know, Smallville had a, plenty of its own faults, but one of the things that I loved about that show was that you saw this progression over the course of many years that that show was on. It was on for 11 years. Think about that. I know, and I loved which, all of it. you know, Lex went from, you know, Clark Kent's best friend to being his greatest villain, um, you know, well, nemesis. Well, his father, though, was part of the problem. Well, sure. I'm sure I know, but that's not my point. My point is that we saw this evolve over time, and we saw the yeah. different influences that brought – it wasn't just, you know, oh, you spilled – chemicals over my hair and made me and made me bald so now i hate you which is you know that was sort of the canonical uh reason why why uh, luther hated superman it started when he was superboy um over that that accident I mean, and that is um, the same fate of two Face. yeah <laughs> it, actually yeah that's true yeah yeah in some in some can they keep changing these things around no that's true i think john cryer should be interesting i'm I, hey you know what it goes back to this. We've always talked about in this show about how in the CW universe, the Arrowverse, they have not they've had very very good casting agents as far as as far as the people that pick play who's going to play who. I have they've proven that they can pick the right people. So if they pick John Cryer, they didn't just do it because hey, let's pick someone famous like sort of like Riverdale saying Molly Ringwald and and Luke Perry, although in those cases they were the right choices. If they picked John Cryer, I have a feeling they saw something in him and they did the audition that we're going to oh, yeah, see. Oh, yeah, sure, I'm we're sure. We're definitely going to see it. Yeah, we're going to see. I think we're going to see, no matter what, you're going to see an interesting take on, on this character. And that's, yeah. that's you know, that's worth the creative risk, I think. Before I move on to the next subject, um, well, same CW thing. Have you guys been seeing the Elseworld teasers? That they've, been, they've had three of them now. I have not seen the latest one, which you posted seen earlier. The images that you've posted here and there. Well, George. the one okay. So Supergirl is in the. She's in one of those chambers that they put the bad guys in in Star Labs, and she's trying to appeal to her sister Alex. Now Alex has long hair, and she's got the Superman black coffee on her shoulder, which implies that Superman has some kind of a regime or control of the city and Star Labs in this universe that they create, and she's telling. Like her, you're my sister in another reality, and she's like, "You're crazy!" And she hits a button and closes her into that um, that chamber so that she can't use her powers. Well, she, I noticed on her shoulder she had the black Superman suit symbol, the black S symbol. So I am starting to now realize in this altered universe that Superman has. It, he, I'm thinking it's like uh, Kingdom Come. You know, remember how Superman had the gulag and he had control and he had risen up and sort of become like a, a, a dictator, sort of, for a little while. Yeah. And, then he, and then he sort of snapped out of it. Or it could be like uh, the video game. Uh, what's that one called? You know what I'm talking about. The, uh, the one where Superman turns bad and they have two versions. Oh, I don't really play the video games, so I don't either. I just you got me games. on that one, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's it's shaping up to be an, an interesting new take on on uh, on on the DC universe or I, universes. Um, you know, I'm not sure how successful. I'm going in. I'll admit, a little skeptical about the whole uh, Flash, Green Arrow, Switcheroo. Um, you know, I, I'm just not sure if that's really going to play, but we'll see. I really am feeling confident about that prediction I made uh, a few weeks ago where by the end of this, the realities are going to merge to where this is one Earth. I see lots of, in my head, I see... Oh, that's not going to happen this year. That's are you sure? Yeah. 
What makes they're going to play? That? They're going to play that out. It will be Crisis on Infinite Earths, and it will be called that. This is this is certainly because they're leading up to it. I agree with you that this is leading in that direction, but you're not going to see it this year. This is too. I don't know. It's too soon. It's too soon. That's something you, know you build why, up to. You know why I don't agree with you on that? I'll tell you why. I mean, normally, tell I, you right after you tell me that, I'll tell you why you're wrong. Go ahead. No, no, no. Why I don't agree? It doesn't mean you're wrong. I'm, I, I, I could be wrong too. So I'm, I don't know for sure. I'm not a. I don't have a. Well, go uh, ahead. Go ahead. All right. The reason why is because when you look at the history of the CW and how they did this, they started with Arrow, and when they announced they were doing the Flash, I remember a few years ago, and I was watching an old podcast, and people were talking about they were worried about like the sudden introduction of superpowers into an, an Arrowverse that was very non-meta, and they were worried about because Arrow had had like at least three seasons before they introduced Barry Allen, and even then it took another year. Before they introduced the Flash, they introduced Barry Allen, but the, the the whole particle accelerator explosion didn't happen until like the last couple of episodes of that season. And then all of a sudden, everything changed in the Arrowverse because they, the particle accelerator exploded, and then the Flash, Barry went into the coma, and then he had his own series debut the season afterwards, and then they slowly built up this universe of people with powers. And and then all, all he had to get used to magic and time travel and, and superpowers and over the next few years after that. And if you look at the progression of how they introduced it, so that by the by now, everybody's used to it. They don't even people people probably can't even remember what it was like before they had all this stuff. I'm thinking that they they now have faith in the audience that they can handle doing something like this. Like making the universes merge that people have gotten so used to multiverses and magic and all this other stuff that they can handle saying what, what's the big deal? Supergirl. I don't out on think the it's a Earth. question. I don't think it's a question of handling things. It's a question of. I mean, in the comics, it took thirty years before uh, before Crisis uh, on Infinite Earths. You know, people were just ha fine with all the different Earths between Earth One, Earth Two, Earth X, Earth S. I mean, you know, every summer you you get a different new Earth. Um, you know, when they had the, the Justice League, Justice Society, uh, uh, Earth One, Earth Two, and all that stuff. Pair up thing every every summer, you know, every summer event. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is the same thing. They're following, they're, they're following the, the, uh, the, the, the pattern exactly. And it's just too soon. <laughs> It's just too I don't soon. Know. I Why do it now when you can when you can milk this for a lot more uh, before uh, before you you do that? There's no need to rush this. Well, there's no if, there's no hanging need out there to that says these all have to be on the same earth. Well, however, on that there is this one part that makes me go. I don't know because they've been hinting a lot about Gotham. Like in the last few er episodes of Arrow, he's gone to Gotham City. Um, in the Flash, they talked about Gotham City. They actually went to Gotham City uh, in the episode I'm going to talk about next. Um, they've been hinting big time. So Gotham City exists in the Arrowverse. Now the big thing has been: is Batwoman that's being introduced in this episode Supergirl's Earth? Because she talks a lot about Gotham and Superman's friend and all that stuff. Or is she from the Arrowverse? Or you know, it's I think the the reason they're going to well, merge sure, them. but that doesn't mean they're going to merge all the worlds. I don't know. I mean that's a huge that's a huge huge step and I just don't think they're not they're it, not going to do the that episode yet. implies there's a reality alter No event. if they were going to if they were going to do it you wouldn't see they're they're narrowing the scope of this it's just uh it's just that they're they're not the legends of tomorrow aren't even part of it um uh this this year so you know something that that's as big an event as as you're suggesting you would you would see everyone in there this one is a they're taking a step back uh to do something that's still a team up still about multiverses but um isn't isn't as big a deal as as like crisis on earth x was last we year we need to make a friendly bet sure i'll make a bet with you because i think i'm right but i also see room for the possibility that you're right but i just think i'm right so here's the deal if I'm right, you are going to introduce the show for the next, well, at least until 2019. <laughs> You're the host, and I'm the guest. <laughs> and if well, I'm right... Well, let's be honest, George. Carlos and I aren't necessarily guests as much as we are co-hosts. No, I know, so. I know, I know. I'm just saying, like, you can introduce the show, like, it's 
Carlos picks the subjects, and I don't have a choice but to let him pick them. And like I'm letting him control it. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying he takes control of all the decisions. So and, you want him? And to that's if I be... lose. No, no, that's if you win. Oh, if I win, okay. Right. If I if you lose, I'll have to think about that one. Um, oh, if I if you lose, I get to post for Axemar. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm joking. Uh, wow, we'll George. Okay. <laughs> I'm so confident that I'm right that that's the only condition. There is no uh, thing that you lose. Okay. That's... Except maybe his respect for you posting Except... on Axe Monitor. No, 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 because I'm not going to do well. No, because he has con- he's he, he's got control over that. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But well, he does. But I'm just saying, like the only downswing to this is that I lose if I'm wrong. But you know, that's how confident I am. But we'll see. You, 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 you realize you don't lose, George, at all, because you're literally shifting responsibility to a film director. <laughs> all right, you got a point. We'll have to come up with a better wager. Uh, but I want to have some kind of a friendly wager. I just think I'm right. So we'll work that out. Uh, we got some time. We'll so find out soon enough. December 9th, I think, is when they premiere I think this, that's so. when it happens, yeah. Yeah, so we got a, we got a couple weeks, three weeks. But um, all right, so... So, speaking of the CW shows, this week's Flash, uh, which was the one with Ragdoll, it was called All Dolled Up. Now, son, real quick, where are you on the Flash? Because I know that you left off... I, it's not, I've not even started, and you're going to keep saying I should go do the thing, and I'll go, okay, George, but I won't go do the thing. Until you're waiting till Netflix. I mean, I, I'm okay with you discussing this stuff. It doesn't bother me. All right, good, because I want to discuss it. Um, I know Carla saw it. Uh, Carlos, this episode, um, I linked earlier, I don't know if you saw it, but, uh, the guy who played Ragdoll, who is a contortionist, who was on America's Got Talent, and he's a human freak, but, uh... Please, let's not use the word freak. Oh, well, no, he calls himself a freak. It's like the circus thing. It's like he lo- he used the word. I'm saying it in a respectful uh, I'm gonna say just talented. Well, no, I'm just saying he says he's a free. It's sort, it's sort of go like a, a term. It's not like a, it's not a derogatory term. Okay, go ahead. Anyways, so I, I, you're saying, but he that's the way word he would use. Um, so he played Ragdoll, and Ragdoll is a character who has been in DC. He was on the Sinister Six. He didn't quite have these powers. He wasn't actually a meta. He was just a contortionist. But the way they incorporated him into the storyline with the, the meta satellite explosion and the dark matter, um, and also that moment with Iris, I don't know. I, I, I talked about this on social media a lot. Iris to me now is, and to a lot of people, is bitchin. Oh, I'm sorry. She's shway. She's so sway. <laughs> what do you think? Um, I thought it was, it was, uh, you know, I was watching the episode because you told me, you know, something major happens with this. So I'm watching. It's like, uh, you know, this is a pretty typical episode of The Flash. And then and then it happened. And I was like, and she did it without hesitation. She right. did it full faith. And it was it was a really like it really surprised me. And there's not a lot of times that The Flash has surprised me. This was a surprise um, just because. It was uh, it was gutsy and um, it it you know and it not only like served the immediate purpose from a plot standpoint but also dealt directly with you know with the whole uh, issue she's had with her daughter from the future right, Nora right. Um, and so it it really brought those two storylines together in a very very powerful way it was uh, it was pretty incredible you know I think one of the things I love about about the Flash, um, in in the way he's portrayed on the CW and Supergirl as well, is that they really are uh, very sort of designed intentionally to be heroic. You know, I mean, we've gone through so many decades now of like dark and brooding uh, superheroes, and I think you know Oliver Queen actually, arguably on Arrow. Uh, is is among them but um that's why you know supergirl and flash were such a such a breath of fresh air um not just in the cw verse but but just in general with superheroes because once again we finally had you know superheroes who were 
really heroic and who were really aware of the role they they play in society and how people look up to them and how they you know work to to be inspirational and i i just thought that um you know, and they, and they even, you know, allude to that sp- directly in The Flash with the whole, you know, Nora talking about the Flash Museum and how he's viewed as this as this big hero in the, in the future. And, um, uh, you know, to, to see how that actually developed and that, you know, Iris is a part of that. I think I think that was a great moment. I loved it. I thought it also juxtaposed really with the whole thing about how Nora looks up to her dad because he's a superhero and she's going back and looking at like the fat flash museum. And she's like inspired, like, can I do this too? And all the superheroics, she never considered that her mom could be a hero too, without having powers. And that was one of the points that she made when she was dumbfounded by what her mom did was you jumped off a building to say dad. And by the way, the actress is so awesome. Oh my God. Every she is, they did such a great job casting her. I mean, she is the perfect daughter of Barry and Iris the, as a hybrid of the two actors and just everything. And just everything. And and she uh, she saw her mom in a new way when she did that. Because, you know what, we, I, I actually shared th- on another chat, um, there's a moment in Smallville, you might remember this scene, Carlos. Uh, there's an episode of Smallville where Lana, the guy becomes a superhero through a comic book that gets mad, and Zatanna was, he becomes, and he pushes Lana off a ledge. Um, and she and Clark jumps off the ledge, and she's falling. And the way they shot the camera was now Clark is different, of course, because he's Superman. So he hadn't learned to fly yet. So Lana's seen him coming down as she's tied up and falling from a building, and he grabs her and he and he just swings himself around. He lands on that car. Okay, I I actually compared the two shots from that Smallville episode. I think they were inspired by that because if you compare the shot with the way Iris jumps off that building and, and Barry is tied up and he's got the meta cuffs on him and he sees Iris coming, it was almost the same way that they shot it. Like instead of Lana looking up and trusting that Clark was going to save her, Barry knew what Iris was doing and when, and, and that she knew as she explained later that if she could just get those cuffs off him, you know, it didn't drop the key. That she knew he would save her, and that you know that was going to be it. It was kind of it was very interesting how the two the two scenes were very similar. Well, I mean, similar. there are only so many ways you can shoot two people falling off buildings. Well, I know, but I, <laughs> you know, so I'm not sure they like went back into the 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 CW. I think if you watch the two clips, and, so you might you might well, see. Where of I'm course, you're going to see similarities because they're portraying the same thing. I mean, that you don't have to have watched one to come up with the other. Um, I, I really doubt that's what happened. I mean, these I are creative have... people who write these shows. They don't have to. They don't have to go back and yeah, find inspiration. They'll, they don't have they'll to do mind. it on their own. I know they don't have to mind, but sometimes they do things as an homage. But also, um, sure. But start... there was nothing fairly. There, there was nothing really remarkable about about that that scene um from smallville i mean we've had i mean you know lois falling off of buildings is practically a, a cliche yeah. when it comes to superman let's talk about so, ralph ralph oh sure I we have ralph. to talk about ralph he has come back because son you haven't seen season five yet, and I know, i'm telling you right now season four ralph is not the same ralph as season five he is okay. awesome this year he is the writers know what to do with him um the spider-man moment was awesome i've seen this in a comic book and he does the swings and then on top of that like when he eats um ragdoll i it took me a few a few t- tries to figure out what he was saying when he was falling onto that car he says i hope i don't land on my keys <laughs> <laughs> i'm like what did he say and he's like iris is like oh my god ralph slept there with him and he comes flying you hear all you hear is I hope I don't land my keys. And like, and he lands on that car, and then you see Ragdoll's inside of him. And he's like, anybody can still get those cuffs. Uh, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was a great moment. I, I also love what they've done with. So, with so, Ralph. You, you, so basically, Ralph is living up to the man he became at the end of season four. Yeah, and, and he's a great detective this season. He works with uh, Harrison Wells, the new version I mean, of Harrison Wells. Who was a great? Who was a great detective in season four? He was just all kinds of screwed up. Well, they do. Uh, they cre- they introduce. Uh, he- he- how do they pronounce it? Sherlock, Sherlock Wells, which is like a French 
Harry Wells, okay. who's like Sh- Sherlock Well, like Sherlock Holmes. Oh wait, is it is it the French Harrison Wells from? Yeah, from well, the, no, the this Council is a new Wells thing. No, this guy's new, but he does have a French. Is it French? I think it's French. He does a yeah, really he's French. See, yeah, see, he, I love this that they keep changing Wells. Yeah, I do but, too, actually. Well, yeah, that's been like same guy playing like a different Doctor Who, for example. But this guy's um, this this Wells is a detective. And 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 because Ralph is a detective, also they work together really well this season. And yeah, it's been a really interesting. They really, Ralph has been awesome this season. So I'm really like excited by the fact that they're doing him justice. And uh, but this episode, him and Iris made a great team. Um, I love what they're doing with Caitlin. This week they're introducing her father, Icicle, who is a major villain in DC. Uh, they're making them... I don't remember if Icicle was related to her in the comics, but there were three I don't versions. remember either. I don't remember either. Yeah, because there were three... Caitlin Snow was actually the first version of Killer Frost in the comics, but then when they right. did the new 52, they made her the new first version, so it keeps changing. But the DC's... Uh, CW is doing something unique with her, and I have no clue where they're heading with this, but it's so far, fairly interesting. Carlos, real quick before we switch subject, what do you think about the whole Cisco? He can't use his vibe powers without making his hands bleed anymore because of the shrapnel from that uh, dagger from Cicada. Well, I'm still trying to get my head wrapped around Cicada's, what Cicada's deal is. So, um, so I don't know. I mean, I like the notion of, um, you know, and they, this is pretty much an explicit theme in this in this past episode. The idea of, you know, I used to be a regular dude. Well, I mean, a genius, but a regular genius. And now then I had superpowers and now the superpowers are gone. And how can I ever be heroic again? And, you know, and the whole idea that you don't have to be have powers to be heroic. I thought, you know, that's nice, you know, and how people um, uh, battle their way back from an injury. I think that's always basically a nice the reverse um, of the doom chair guy. Oh, this season has been probably my favorite of all five so far, to be honest with you. So far. Well, I certainly, I think I've said this to you before, I'm enjoying this season way more than last season. I, I personally, I'm enjoying this better than all of them. I, I'm not even saying that, like, just to say it. Like, I love the whole Nora thing. I love the whole... I do, too, except for the real problem I have with the whole... She's changing the past. I mean... Like right I and left. I am curious. I am curious. Yeah, <laughs> I am really curious to see how that's gonna play out. It's like she's she's faster than the Flash is, and she's like the end of that the end of season four. She's like, I made a terrible mistake. It's like I'm I'm your daughter. It's like the first thing the first thing they should absolutely do in the new season is try to send her back and literally get her back, and she just comes back because. Uh... You'll see. No, 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 this, this, because that's the first thing in my head. They've dealt with this for three seasons now. That when you screw with the past, you screw with the past. No, they yeah. Not they cannot keep making this same stupid mistake again, or I'll probably just abandon the show because it's uh, it's so infuriating. It, I, I have to agree with you there, son. Uh, I mean, as much as I love Nora, and I do, I think she's a great character. I think the act, actor is great. Um, I like the storylines. I like, you know, I, I like the things she brings up, but I still have a problem with the fact that she is changing the past and they haven't dealt with that. Like and they have to kind of deal with that. past. But from their point of view, she's changing their future. And you know, well, as she revealed to Vary, so they don't necessarily not want to be changed. Him disappearing. Well, either way, it's still... So are we gonna call, she's still so changing we, what is. Are we um, going to call that future episode where she actually has to deal with all of this Nora point? <laughs> That's a good point. No, no, no. If it was Flashpoint, this would be um, uh, XS point. Because that well, was no, the, no, Nora the, the, Point works better. No, Nora Point works better because it's yeah. her future that she's changing. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, before we move on to, um, I want to let Carlos talk about Fantastic Beasts, but bef- because we're still on the DC theme, I will do one more thing uh, where I want to just quickly, quickly give a mini review of the latest Titans episode, just because we're on the the whole DC beat right now. Um, I just want to mention that uh, I talked about over the last few episodes my my decision on whether Titans is getting better and it, it, this new episode, Jason Todd was the episode where uh, Dick Grayson's Robin meets Jason Todd. And 
I want to tell you guys right now that, and this is a spoiler free. Um, this was a great episode. The guy they they got to play Jason Todd is perfect. You can see him becoming a future Red Hood, and he he has all these great moments with Dick. There's one moment where uh, Dick makes a great. Uh, I feel weird saying Dick, but anyways, uh, to yeah, separate. Yes, the, yes, say Grace. I, ha I have to say th say it because we have to separate which Robin I'm talking about. Where Dick says, to, <laughs> I know, I can't, where. Well, wait a minute. Wait, wait, is 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 Jason Todd? Is it Jason Todd Grayson? No. And say Grayson. Eh, that sounds too weird. But he um he's telling him um he because because Dick I mean sorry Jason want is is so happy that Batman sent him to help him. Uh, and he's like, you know, I always want to meet you, and maybe you can give me some pointers and all that stuff. And they have two different philosophies that they're coming from. And he's like, I don't understand why you wanted to not be Robin anymore. And he goes, because he goes, and, and finally he said this one great line to him. He says, you can't unlearn what Bruce teaches you. And he says, and one day you're going to understand that once you go to, once you get to a certain point, you can't shut it off. And he goes, that's where I'm at. And it was just so great how he's trying to say, you need to stop, you know, don't be excited by being Robin. He's turned you into a weapon. Uh, that's why I had a problem with it, because I don't like who I am right now. And he says, I can't unlearn what he taught me. He goes, And he's like, you should be grateful. And he's like, I was at first, but now I'm not. And it's just the way they do this whole Bat Family, like, angst, and like he, how one experienced Robin is trying to explain to the other you know, that you don't understand what's going to happen, the, why he's doing what he's doing for you, that once you figure it out, you're going to feel the way I do, that you need to get out now. Because he's just like, no, beating people up, even cops. And he's all excited. He's like, I love kicking ass. And their whole philosophy is that he's trying to explain to him where he's making a mistake. And, uh, and, and this episode serves for him to start to figure out, you can't have two Robins. And, and there's a cute moment where Beast Boy's like, there's two Robins. Can I be a Robin? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, how do I sign up? He's like, can I be a Robin? He's like, there was like, no. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for spoiling the episode, George. No, I spoiled one line, but, uh, it, it starts, but the whole, you get the idea. There's so much to it, but by the end of this episode, and this is not a spoiler, like everybody knows this is coming. It just helps to inform him as to his decision that there can't be two Robins. You know where this is leading. Yeah, uh, it's not gonna be next episode because I saw the teaser. He's still Robin, but you know. But I think I think I wasn't sure if by the end of this season he was gonna become Nightwing. But I feel now like that's gonna be how they end it, where he he reveals himself as Nightwing. Um, and so I'm excited. They really did a great job. Uh, the only downside is, and I've heard other people complain about this for a show that's supposed to be called Titans. They seem to be more like it should be called the Bat Family. A lot of people are talking about that, like. They spent a lot of time focusing on certain characters and the whole theme of Robin coming to terms with his Batman angst and all this other stuff. I, I don't agree with that because I know from, the, <laughs> from you know, that this is what needs to happen to develop what, where it's going. Because in the, when they first created the Titans comic uh, in the New Teen Titans, he was Robin at first. But throughout, yeah, he, he had a journey that he went through in the comics to separate himself from Batman. Because Batman was doing just like he did in this TV show. He was trying to interfere. He was trying to protect Robin. He was trying to be in his shit. And he's just like, he's like slowly trying to break off and form his own thing. And meeting this new Robin helped him realize Batman's already moved on. Now I need to move on. So, you know, it's, it's, it was just really well written, really well played out. So I, I hope that you eventually uh, watch the season, Carlos. I think you're going to agree with me um, just because of your appreciation for the source material so indeed well i'm looking forward to catching up on it uh eventually and uh when i do you can bet that i will love talking Give it to a you review. about it yeah awesome. yeah we'll talk about it again in the future all right so carl i'm just still you... thinking of, i'm just still thinking about you saying that the, that it's the batman family and the only thing that's going through my head is the adams family they do focus a lot on the whole overarching thing being, but it's not. People are saying that are wrong. It, it's focused. One episode focused on Gar and the Doom Patrol. You know, one episode focused on Raven, and and I'm sure there's going to be a total Starfire episode before the season's over with. So no, it's that's not a fair thing that people are supposing. Um, so yeah, but they need to do that though in order to make it the legitimate, get to the end, and make them their own Titans team. 
Uh, oh, also, this episode has a lot to do with them getting their uh, this is their version of the Titans Tower. Um, it's, it's and safe house. You'll see. So, anyways, Carlos, I know you wanted to talk about uh, the Fantastic Beast franchise. Uh, what did you have to say about that? Well, have either of you seen it? I have not. I've never been. I don't mind you talking about it. I know about it. I know Johnny Depp's in the second one. Was he in the first one, too? He was uh, in, in the first one, too. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Um, I was never Harry Potter fans. Um, I have heard nothing but good things, but it's part of the Potter verse, I guess. Would you, Let me ask you this before you talk about it. If I, you don't have to go back and watch anything from Harry Potter to appreciate this, right? You don't have to go watch Harry Potter, but you do have to have watched the first Fantastic Beast. Well, I mean, that's what I mean. Uh, okay, so it's its own thing, but it happens to be in the Potter verse. Yeah, I've actually seen a few articles, and I, 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 again, I haven't seen the movie, so I can't I can't say one way or the other. But I've seen several articles from several different uh, writers going, "Why was she allowed to write the scripts for these movies? They are so full of plot holes and this and that and the other." And I'm like. Uh, okay. Is this a movie I really want to see? Well, I will tell you that... <laughs> um, it, it has some very deep flaws in it. Um, visually, of course, it's lovely, except for one CGI, these cats that were awful. Um, but... Uh, um, the plot issues are less about holes than they are. Well, I guess you could call them holes. I mean, there's just some unmotivated things that characters do that I have no idea why they've done them. Uh, and I was like, did I just, did I doze off during some of this? Or did I forget something from the first movie? And there's so much exposition where they're explaining this and explaining that, that it just, it, it makes the movie feel overly long and like you're not getting to see every all the stuff you you wish you could see um i mean there was a lot about it i liked but um but yeah plot wise i think that was my biggest problem with this film there was just so much they had to explain and it's like well you shouldn't you know it's the whole show versus tell thing that you know they teach us in on day one in in screenwriting class um and this does a lot of a lot of of telling and the showing they do, they figure, you know, you know, it's so magical and wondrous that it'll offset the, the telling parts and that it doesn't actually work out that way. I mean, the, the parts of the story that are weak are, are weak because it's a weak story. So, um, I won't go into a lot of, of details since, uh, you guys haven't seen it yet, other than to say that, uh, yeah, there's some things that happen in it that, uh, I, I think they just have, like they have one character who just goes to join the, the the evil wizard, and I'm like, why did she do that? Like I don't get why oh, you're. Oh, is that uh, the snake girl? No, uh, it's uh, uh, Queenie, the telepathic one we met in the first in the mo oh, first right. movie. Um, and like I don't get why she does that. They don't really explain it. Um, anyway, so it has issues like that 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 really bring it down again i'm glad i saw it i wouldn't have wanted to miss it but um it is certainly not among the strongest uh of the outings in the Potterverse. i know there was some controversy about um and i don't you know forgive me for not remembering the exact names but one of the characters was always implied to be a naga which is a snake person in mythology indian mythology and she turns out to show that and i think was it the first yeah one? that happens no, it happened. Yeah, or the second one. one. Okay. And that caused some controversy for some weird reason. But but um but um JK Rollins said um she said that that was always with the intention, like the implication the Naga is in mythology, that it was always implied that that character was one. I don't know. Do you know you know what I'm talking about? Uh, no, I have see, no idea what you're talking the, about. <laughs> okay, see, see that's I, the, I'll be honest. She wrote uh, Rowling wrote these books in the nineties. Without all of this, without all, all of this diversity, quote unquote, fervor o over everything, and with the success of the movies, she was asked to write even more stuff, like the Fantastic Beast stuff. 
And so she threw, well, she didn't just throw, she shoehorned in a whole bunch of diversity stuff. Like Dumbledore being gay, or this, or that, or the other, or the snake being Honestly, an Asian Honestly, I lady. don't I'm think actually, she sat back and said, no, well, I, need, I, I have a lot of black the, marks I have to tick the, off. So I'm going to put this in and that in and the it. other thing. I think it's just a bad story because it's a bad story, not because... Because of diversity, I mean, well, it just I mean, please. Well, no, the backlash to it kind of proves the point that we're in this kind of culture in the first place. You mean a no, culture oh, why, where we actually is... depict people besides white people? I mean, then sure. Well, no, it's like why is the bad guy snake an Asian lady? That's problematic. All right, here's the thing. Let me just read it to you. The thrilling final trailer for the forthcoming Fantastic Beast movie dropped on Tuesday. This is an older article. But it says, One of the scenes presents Credence, Ezra Miller, whispering a well-known name for Harry Potter fans, Nagini. The trailer then shows a woman transforming into a snake, which was shocking for two reasons. First, it reveals that, that Nagini used to be human. Second, the woman turned into snake is played by South Korean actor Claudia Kim. As, as Vogue pointed out, the role started a discussion about representation and bias. Uh, because the franchise has faced criticism for the lack of representation, um, and Nagini's submissive character and her ties to Voldemort. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of controversy about it because a Nagini, uh, an Anaga, it's an old mythological thing where it's a person that can turn into a snake monster or a, mo a snake snake shape shapeshifters like werewolves, but they're snakes. Um, it's a, it's an Asian uh, mythology, and I guess the actual actress not being the right ethnic group is what bothered people. I don't know. What no, is it's the, the right problem ethnic is, group? Yeah, yeah, see, that's the thing. That's the thing. That's the problem that I have with all these people who call themselves social justice warriors and go off on these weird ass rants. It's supposed to be Indonesian, and they used a South Korean actress. It's 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 literally that. Uh, it's not. It has nothing to do. It has nothing to do with the the fact that the the that that the 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 historical race of whatever mythology is incorrect. It's that you had the minority character now the villain. That's it. J.K. Like, Rowling the, said, I've not seen. I have never seen as much vitriol as I have out of the LGBT community when they screamed at J.K. Rowling on Twitter. Sit your ass down. Dumbledore was never gay. Fuck you for making him gay. That's just signal, vir you know, virtue, si fake signal virtually, or virtue signaling. That's it's like, like, what the fuck is wrong with you people? You talk, you people talk about diversity and needing diversity so fucking much, and then when it's here, you beat down the door because it's obviously fake. Fuck you people. You're the people that said that the that the girl who's playing Batwoman is not gay enough to play right. Batwoman That's or, a good or example. what the hell ever. What the fuck is wrong with you people? JK Well, well okay, uh, first of all, go ahead, you go know, ahead. I don't disagree with you, but I think I, I, I have a problem with this whole you people thing. With this whole notion that everyone who uh, like <laughs> this SJW thing is such a broad brush. I don't know who you're talking about. You know, I mean, I know there are people out there saying these things, but there's like, I don't have any sense of how widespread this is amongst uh, uh, amongst the LGBT community. It's certainly not among amongst the people I know in the LGBT community. I mean, I've heard some people complain about things, but I hear people complain about a lot of things all the time, and they're not all LGBT people either. So I just, I just have a problem with this notion that we have to like mo make these groups monolithic and then use broad brushes to, to beat back at them. I'm like, find me a, a person who actually said it. Read me the tweet. Read me the article. Read me the blog. Whatever. Just like we did with Bill Maher. Okay. Because as long as we're talking about vague generalities and monolithic groups and painting with broad brushes, I just I don't even know what we're really talking about, honestly. I I I um yeah this I sh I'll just read this, but even though it's not really that big of a deal, J.K. Rollins responds. It shows one of her tweets. She says. The Naga are a snake-like mythical creature of Indonesian mythology, hence the name Nagini. They are sometimes depicted as wings, sometimes half-human, half-snake. Indonesian co Indonesia compromises a few hundred ethnic groups, including ja Javanese, not Japanese, Javanese, Chinese, and Batawi. Have a lovely day. And then people are going, you know, still going after her about it. And it's like, 
yeah, so I don't know. It's it's yeah. This is silly that they even have cheese and has to defend that. Um, well, you know, people are allowed to complain and cheese allowed to respond, and you know, it is what it is. So let's move on, shall we? You know, did we learn anything? Well, if we stop yelling at each other long enough to assess what we've learned, uh, you know, what lessons are to take away from it, then sure. I agree. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so that's interesting. You know, you could be actually wanting to watch these movie now. <laughs> well, I mean, I get around to it. I took, when my daughter was little, I took her to see the second Harry, I, I don't know, which, which one of the Harry Potters had David Tennant and, he, and his character died, his father, he was the son of Harry Crumb or whatever the guy's name was. Oh, he was in, uh, was it Azkaban? Um, Phoenix one? I don't know. No, not the Phoenix one. Um, no, he was second already, or man. third one. My daughter was a little at the time, but she loved Harry Potter, so I took her to see it. I personally didn't have any interest in Harry Potter, and so I, I took her to see it, you know, because she wanted to see it. And I had custody of her, of course, and, you know, I'm going to do with the dad thing and take, take your kid to the movie. Uh, but I liked the movie, but I just didn't, the Harry Potter universe just never interested me. I don't hate it. I just, just didn't interest me. But I know this is part of that world. Now, is it, correct me if I'm wrong, is Jude Law the younger Dumbledore? Yes, that's true. All right. You know, that might actually get me interested because I like him as an actor. So. Well, you know, one criticism I did read today about about the movie and about uh, Dumbledore's especially was <laughs> they were like, you know, like, seriously, you expect me to believe that a flamboyant dresser like Dumbledore when he was young was wearing a waistcoat for an entire movie? <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, by the way, here's a little trivia. Um, when they made when when they did the whole Harry Potter thing, even J.K. Rollins admits the whole multicolored scarf was a tribute to Tom Baker as Doctor Who. Oh, that's great. Yeah. She actually had him in mind when she did that. So, just a little trivia. It's a super geek show. Might as well plop that information in there. Um, okay. So, we'll do at least one more topic. Um, and uh, Sun and I wanted to kind of give a quick a little review of something that several people are out there are excited about. Netflix dropped uh, She-Ra, the new version. Mm -hmm. um, I personally always loved He-Man and She-Ra as a crossover couple in the 80s. Like, they, they were kind of like He-Man and, and, and Xena and, you know, Bionic Man, and it was, except they happened to be brother and sister. But I I was a big fan of that. My only complaint, I liked what they'd done with this new She-Ra. My only complaint is that as of right now, it could change. They're approaching this like he-man and that whole connection doesn't exist she's a standalone i don't like that personally i can live with it but it just something feels wrong because of my childhood being stampled over but um i'm okay with it it was good um i don't know what do you think son well see here's the thing as as the way i see it the way i see it and and i've not extensively watched the the 80s cartoon i've seen like quite a few episodes of it but it doesn't seem like there is any before times from that point in the 80s for, for She-Ra. Um, and what th this entire setting for the new She-Ra is that, yeah, there was a first She-Ra thousands of years ago. So this is a time far set out from the 80s She-Ra. So it is entirely possible that those connections still technically exist. Uh, just it that just seems like a major is, coincidence, though, with you got Glimmer and Seahawk and Boat. That seems a little weird. Well, I, I can understand that. I, believe me, I can completely understand that. But, I mean, you know, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it, right? Ooh, well done. <laughs> they did a good job, but, though, of... Uh, I, 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 Go ahead. The, 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 the series itself, I'd, I've seen flack from both sides talking about how it's to this or to that or, or just just hating the show outright because it's it's not meant for them, right? And I watched I watched the first couple of episodes and I went, I actually kind of enjoy this. There's a story here that I never saw in any singular episode watching the old Shira. That continues, and it's a it's just as action packed as the the eighties version, maybe even more to some extent. And uh, the story seems to fit with the themes that they're going for. 
My only problem, my singular only problem, is the bottom of her outfit. I cannot stand that. You mean the shorts? The, I cannot stand those shorts in that ultra half mini skirt thing that she's got going on. I yeah, just, well, I can't stand that. I, they actually, what Netflix has done this interesting is they also have added the original Shira uh, series to watch so you can compare them. Um, so I always loved the original. Um, I like the way it spun off. They did this movie that was in the in the theaters, uh, He Man and Shira's Secret Secret of the Sword, and you can watch it on Netflix. Uh, it was the story how they found out that they were twin twin brother and sister that were separated from these two worlds, Eternia and Etheria, and the whole story behind how the sword got split and all that stuff. Um, but this actually pretty close to being the same there's only minor little details that they've made different like for example she was friendship with Catra is more more emotional it's more like when Kat- Catra feels betrayed because she left the horde to go become a rebel you know uh, that uh that part's a little bit more detailed but it's basically the same story what a lot of fans like is that um the character of seahawk when he comes into play in one of the episodes, I don't think he reached that episode yet. Um, is, he's pretty true to the '80s version. He, to me, is like Bruce Campbell when he played Autolycus on Xena, uh, the the thief with the heart of gold. You know, he's being Bruce Campbell, but he's Autolycus, and um, you know, he he reminds me of him. And they translated him exactly like they didn't make a new version of him. He's got kind of the same guy pulled out of the '80s and planted into this modern cartoon. So I like that. Um, I don't know. I'm hoping that they do connect the the He Man story to it later. But from what I read and heard from the producers, there were two reasons why so far that hasn't happened. Number one is they haven't explored getting the rights yet from because they're doing a He Man movie live action, and the other reason why is because they they kind of wanted to see if they could just kind of make this a stand out like Shira doesn't need He Man to have her own show. But maybe that'll change later. I mean, I'm hoping they do because the fans, the old fans, loved that connection between the two. But I can kind of see where they're coming from here. They kind of like trying to say, you know, she doesn't need He Man. She's her own person, her own show. To you don't you don't have to spin off to start off, you know. But that's like, in my opinion, that's like Supergirl. She didn't do that either. She didn't. This version of Supergirl didn't spin off from a Superman series, right? She started off, and then they brought in Superman, little by little. So I'm hoping that's kind of where they're going with this. That's my opinion. I think that's a good point. Yeah. Even though I don't care about She-Ra at all, but I think <laughs> you make a good point. What's that stuff going up, or He-Man, or? Ugh, I hate, I hate both those shows. <laughs> what was it you didn't like about them? Uh, they were just so obvious, and I, you know, I just I that didn't like true. anything kind of about. I mean, I thought, you know, it's like let's have a, a tiger, except make him green and yellow instead of orange and black, and um, you know, and just uh, his those little... were the, the, the a lot of a lot of the eighty shows were basically toy of the week shows. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. They did it, actually, this no, one definitely was. No, they did. They made the toys first and then they made it into a show. Um by the way, here's a little trivia. There used to be a, a He-Man Superman crossover cuz uh, at one point DC had the rights and they did it. He-Man went over to Returnia and he met I mean, sorry, Superman went over to Returnia and he met he, he also met the ThunderCats, but he met He-Man. <sighs> um and uh because magic can hurt Superman, you know how that fight went. Um yeah. but they both teamed up against Skeletor. It was cool for its time, but um, yeah, it was it was cute. But I don't know. I like this the the series. Um, just like with Clark Kent and his glasses, and it never made any sense why nobody figured out that uh, you know Prince Adam was He Man and uh, Adora was She Ra because they they pull out their swords. And the only difference is they're wearing cuter costumes, and you know one of them has a tan, uh, but they're the same exact looking people. So whatever. Grown. And I hated his haircut. Worst haircut. <laughs> He's got the bowl cut, you know. Ugh, it was awful. She, however, looked awesome, but the heels didn't work because you can't really run around heels like that. But anyways, unless you're a superhero. You can in the fantasies of white men. That's true. That's true. All right. Well, um, yeah, you know, I'm going to mention one last thing, and then that's it because, you know, two good things in the horizon. I've been watching Daredevil, and you know, I'm not going to get into it until I finish the. Uh, I'm halfway. I'm about halfway I can't, through. I, 
<laughs> see, see, here's the problem. I don't mind spoilers, but I have to hold my tongue. Yeah, I want to see him have sex with the nun woman because of my weird my <laughs> All right. Settle down there. Settle down there, George. I, I, I'm just no. saying everybody keeps oh, no. saying and no. Yeah. Like, no, no, you don't want no. that. You don't want that. And I'm like, <laughs> I want to like look up spoilers, but it's like, no, I'm gonna wait because I have Oh to, god, I have to hold my tongue. Oh god. I just sense there's like she knows something about him. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. She but, does. I think it's because she wants to ride him. I don't know. No, 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 don't, George, no. Don't give me any hints. I want to figure this out. Don't, myself. don't go there. Don't go. Don't go to that place. Don't go to that place. Please don't. Just, just let it play out. See, now you're making me think she dies, and that you know, I'm, that's when I get my hopes up. Let, but, uh, let, let just let the just let it play out. Let it play out, George. Once oh, you yeah. get there. My dreams no, many times. No, 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 no. Let let the series play out as it plays right. out, and once you get there, then you can come back to us and go, "Holy shit! Holy shit!" I probably will, I'm sure, but I won't regret it. Anyways, so they announced. So I so far uh, I'm liking it, but I don't think it's as hype awesome as everybody's making it out to be. Um, but I'm enjoying it, but it's just not as exciting to me as. Um, Everybody's making it out to be like this is the best season. No, I just don't see that. Hey, yet. thanks. But to, if, if well, he welcome, has sex with her, I, welcome to where I feel about uh, the new season of Iron Fist. But if she has sex with him, that could have explained why everybody's excited about. I'm, I'm no, just saying. no, George. Don't I'm go joking. There. I'm joking. But kind of. But um, no. But I, it's it's interesting. I'll put it that way. Um, she's a good character though. The nun. She's you know she drinks. She swears. I mean that's the kind of nun you want. You know, you don't want a nun that doesn't do that. It makes them interesting. Um, but you don't want to mess with them either because they got those rulers and they smack you. Um, so anyways, <laughs> but they did announce that Daredevil Season 4 has been pitched. Has been pitched. Hopefully it'll get picked up and that it's not one of the many cancellations that we talked about. Um, who knows? It's possible it won't get canceled. Uh, it might be just that some of the shows went and some of them won't. Um, well, you know... Uh... Right. Well, you know, we know that that Daredevil has been pitched to Netflix for another season. So if Netflix picks it up, then it stays with Netflix. So we'll see. So, so you think that's an option that they get to choose because of the, the rights that they have? The contract. That's my guess is that they probably made some sort of, uh, you know, multi-season deal for the show um, and that Netflix could choose to cancel it if they wanted it wanted to. Um so, I mean, we can only right right now all we have are theories and uh, what they decide to do with uh, with, well, the most successful ones, Netflix and Jessica Jones, I think will will tell us a lot about what the actual state of affairs is between Netflix and Marvel. Yep. And, and we also got good news that Doctor Who has been confirmed to come back next year rather, rather than two years later, which was some of the fears people had because BBC has been known. We talked about this to do that to save up money. But it looks like they're actually, they are coming back next year, which is awesome. Um, there's only a few episodes left. There's like, four, what is it, four more episodes this for yeah. now? Yeah, four more, and then the New Year's special. Which, by the way, there's a lot, strong theory, a, a lot of rumors that they're going to bring in the Daleks. Um, I actually believe that, and the only reason why is because the only thing uh, Chris Chimnell said was we wouldn't see the Daleks or anybody else in Series 11. But technically, on New Year's Day, that's not Series 11. So he could do that. I think technically it is counted as part of series eleven. I, it's, but I don't know if they, the Christmas specials have always been standalone, as far as yeah. Uh, but they're grouped. They're usually grouped with one series or another. But this is New Year. Yeah, I don't think that matters. I don't know. There's a lot quit, of strong quit, 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 quit trying to quit trying to do the mental gymnastics to explain this away, George. Just, just All right, stop. <laughs> let it happen. It, hey, you know what? I don't. I don't really love the dogs enough to say I care that they come back. I wouldn't mind the, this team meeting the dogs and realizing and finding out something more about the doctor. Um, because they, you know, there's a lot they don't know about her. Um, and I, it'd be nice to see them figure some, no, get to know her a little more about her past, um, and about the time war and all that, but we haven't seen that yet. Um, so anyways, yeah, so there's a lot of good stuff coming out. I can't wait to talk about the Elseworlds crossover when it comes out. I just have a feeling that's going to be, Pretty cool. I've seen new images from Entertainment Weekly with Batwoman using her grappler gun and stuff like that, and I'm excited. I'm excited. I saw a scene with Lois and Clark on the on the Kent farm that looked cool. 
Uh, this, I'm, I just think that they're going to really go all out on that one. It's a lot of good television coming up. Let's put it that way. Uh, I look forward to getting to the episode where I find out what's going on with that nun so that people can laugh about it and poke fun at me. And Oh, no, no, no. no. It's not going to, it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a, a laugh and poke fun. It's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a us going, it's okay, George. As you go, I am so sorry. I doubt I'll apologize. You don't know me that well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. No matter what, I don't. I'm pretty deviant sometimes. Anyways, um, so yeah, so I think that should wrap it up for today. We had some good topics to discuss, and we had a good conversation. So, Carlos, where can people find you on social media? I am at Axamonitor on Twitter and at C Pedraza on Twitter, and uh, of course at Axamonitor.com. And in the Axe Monitor Facebook group on the Facebooks. And son, what about you? I, although I think I know. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash sunsyallfan. That's usually where I post my uh, goings on in the podcasting world. You can find me on Twitter at chooch99a. That's C-H-O-O-C-H 99A. Um, I don't use it a lot, but I do check it more often lately. Um, and also here, I, you can find me here, obviously, um, at, at Super Geeks. And we have other projects, too, in the horizon. We link some of that in the comments down below if you at least look at it on YouTube. Um, but we will be expanding out into other uh, media soon. So I want to thank you guys for joining me this week for episode 15. And we'll talk to you next time. Totally at Chooch99A. Yeah. <laughs>